G'day, mate. Forty here. Uh, Tucker Carlson just uh, released an interview with Amy Wax, the University of Pennsylvania law professor, who said a lot of uh, controversial things that are being picked up by Media Matters and uh, the, the left. So let's check out this interview. Amy Wax, uh, controversial, uh, about as far right as you can go in American politics today and still be within the Overton Fair window. Fair to start with the Glenn Lowry exchange. Would you say that's where the trouble started or did it precede that? Well, actually, I think the first thing that happened, and this was something that really did surprise me, although I was less and less surprised with each passing incident, was when I... So you can tell by the droning quality of her voice that she has told this story a hundred times. I published an op-ed in the Philadelphia Inquirer praising bourgeois values. I remember this. And saying this was co-authored by Larry Alexander, um, who was at San Diego Law, um, saying, you know, making some pretty simple, what I thought were uncontroversial points about how important personal conduct and the norms that we adhere to in our day-to-day -day life. This is, we've already touched on this theme, how important those are to um, achieving success in life, no matter what your background. Uh, and that- So I think my, my sound problems are problems from the past because I bought myself a new XLR cable. So this crappy old one is going in the trash. So let's see if my mic still keeps cutting off. Those virtues work especially well in our modern technological capitalistic societies, which have been the most successful societies on earth, comparatively speaking, on how we should return to those touchstones uh, and, and take them far more seriously than we do. And, and that was the op-ed. Uh, did you and it created it to... a firestorm. Well, did you expect that? <laughs> no, I, I honestly, I honestly was surprised that anybody would object to those points, not see them as basic common sense, or regard them as somehow racist or bigoted. I mean, one of the things we said is that not all cultures are equivalent or equivalently successful. Um, not all sets of norms are equip people equally to function in our society. That also seemed obvious. Uh, but that was considered a racist thing to say. Is the counter argument that all kinds of behavior equally equip people to succeed in our society? I mean, so what's the argument against that? I think the counter argument is that behavior doesn't matter. <laughs> that, which <laughs> is That's bizarre and preposterous. And I think no one... I mean, she, she's obviously right. Not all behaviors, not all cultural values equally equip you for success in America or in the West. Not all cultures are equally good at equal things. So fine, you, let's say you're a cultural relativ relativist. That doesn't mean you're holding that all cultures are equally adept at equal things. You're, you're simply saying you can't proclaim that one culture is just inherently essentially superior to another or that there's one value or there's one measure that uh, will rank cultures hierarchically. So yeah, obviously different people have different gifts, different groups ha have different gifts, different cultures have different gifts, different nations have different gifts, different YouTube hosts have different gifts, different genres meet different needs in the human being, different religions are good for different things. If you're really concerned about your eternal salvation, then Christianity is the only game in town. There's no other religion that will promise you the assurance of your heavenly salvation like, like Christianity, all right? So if you if you want a, a strong racially-based approach to, to life, you don't have many options in America. You, on the left, you can go with something like Black Lives Matter or La Raza on the left for what? Well, it's uh, Spanish for the race. Or on the right, you've got uh, variations of, uh, of ethnic nationalisms and the alt-right, but you don't have many choices, for example, if you want to make race central to how you view the world. Really believes on some level, not, you know, I mean, not even the limousine liberals who espouse this kind of stuff. No. Really believe it. They because, all get up early and go for a run, I notice. Well, right. I mean, they, and they teach their children, yeah. you know, to behave this way and not that way. I don't know why they bother, 
Uh, of course, they would say that, well, there, there's no inconsistency there. That point is lost on me. Um, but yeah, it's structures that matter. It's systems that matter. We are all puppets on a string and we are determined and affected by these outside forces that we don't control. And especially, I think they're well, structures do matter, systems do matter, and we are frequently affected by systems outside of our control, and we don't even realize how much, for example, our community or the system we're working in. There are plenty of places where you will go in life where the architecture surrounding you, for example, if you're in a church or you're in a synagogue, you're in a mosque or you're in a bar or you're in a sports stadium, that architecture will have more effect on how you behave right? The building that you are in will frequently have more effect on how you behave than any personality variant, you know, whether you're extroverted or introverted, right? Just being in a church will have a more profound effect on what you say and do than any personality difference between you and other parishioners. I is on the so-called oppressed or persecuted peoples, aka disadvantaged minorities. Um, how dare you say about them? that they have any meaningful control over their lives that okay so th there's understandable squeamishness about pointing a finger at at groups and saying you're screwing up uh perhaps some th there's something to be said for for some understanding that uh, different groups simply have different strengths right N not all groups are going to be equally good at the same thing I, I don't notice a lot of jews playing for the los angeles lakers yes i know there was a jew here and there was a jew there generally speaking not a lot of ashkenazi jews not a lot of any type of jews uh, are playing in the nba so clearly different groups have different strengths therefore therefore perhaps we should be gentle where, where we highlight the say the shortcomings of a group recognizing that uh, the group's going to be, say, short in, in one area and uh, overachieving in another area. That is a scary thing to contemplate because then you start thinking, well, if their lives are going poorly and, you know, they are bedeviled by inequalities and disadvantages, maybe, maybe it might be their fault a little bit or they could do something. All right, that's... I, I, she gets into a tremendous amount of trouble that is self-caused, all right? Most of Amy Wax's problems are caused by Amy Wax. They're not caused by the, the evil left, right? She can phrase things differently if she doesn't want to avoid giving gratuitous offense. A, a, I think a, a better way of putting things is that not all groups have equal gifts and not all groups are equally cut out for equal success in, in different areas of life. And that's not blaming. I don't blame Jews that they don't play frequently in the National Football League or the NBA, right? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there aren't many Roman Catholic physicists, right? When it came time for the Manhattan Project, when it came time for building America's nuclear, nuclear bomb, it, it wasn't Catholics that we were turning to, right? The physicists who, who gave us the nuclear weapons were primarily Protestant and Jewish, right? I don't think we need to say, Catholics, that's your fault. There's something wrong with you. Maybe there's something about Catholic culture or there's something in in Catholic groups in, in, in the West or in America that uh, has not predisposed them towards success in physics. I think there are more effective ways of saying what Amy Wax is saying that more people will be after here. She has apparently gotten to that place in life where she just doesn't give a damn. And she's just going to, she's talking in public the same way that you would pretty much talk in, in a bar. And so, no, if, if your group's low achieving in one area, I think there are far more effective ways of pointing that out than by saying it's your fault. Maybe your group uh, isn't as abled, right? Differently abled, right? Different groups have, have different gifts. So no, it, it's not my fault that I'm not six foot 10, right? It's not my fault that I don't, sing for a living. I don't have a good singing voice. I could practice and practice, and at best I'd have a mediocre singing voice. It's not helpful to say, 40, it's your fault that you're not a great singer. I simply wasn't born with the gifts of becoming a great singer. They could self-improve in ways that would have some, eff uh, some efficacy. But if you don't... Yeah, they could self-improve, but maybe they're better suited for other endeavors, right? Not everyone needs to become a physicist 
or a lawyer or a dentist. All right. Not everyone needs to say make uh, professional success or earning money the number one priority in their life. Right. Maybe uh, some groups just want to put more emphasis on spending time with family and doing things that uh, come naturally to them, such as say socializing with their their own group and uh, and seizing on their own native gifts and making the most of them rather than say, oh, we must imitate the white man. We must beat the white man at physics and math and dentistry and, and law, because unless we meet up to, to the white man's standards, then the fault is with us. I don't think that's a helpful way of approaching things. Don't believe that. Then what you're basically describing is an animal. If you're saying that this person, this human being has no responsibility we are animals, all right? We are animals. Now, you can make a faith-based argument that on top of that, we're, we're gifted with the, the spirit of the divine, but we are animals, all right? We're animals. ...for what he does. Nothing about his life is the result of choices that he made. You're not describing a human being, actually, at that point, are you? Well, right. I mean, that's the dark side and the downside of it. And I've joked with Glenn Lowry about this. Who's in he's interviewed me several times. He's a Brown University professor who has a blogging head. And I said to him, Glenn, here's, here's the good news. You know, the good news is that, um, or maybe the bad news is that white males are evil persecutors. Uh, but the good news, and they're responsible for everything bad. But the good news is, they're responsible for everything. They're the only ones who are responsible. <laughs> but it does seem... They're the only full moral human beings. So, so, so maybe, I mean, my theory is that all of this stuff really is just ruling class narcissism. And it's a way for, you know, beneath the rituals of self-abasement, what they're really saying is I'm the most important. Well, right. I'm the only full human being. Right. The only full... Oh, no. There, there, we're back. So... I, uh, I went to the beach yesterday. I went to the Venice Beach boardwalk. And as I'm walking down the Venice Beach boardwalk, uh, talking with a friend right near the, the Pacific Jewish Center, this topless lady strolls by on roller skates. It was like roller girl out there on, on the Venice boardwalk. And here I am just like sharing words of Torah with a friend, you know, near the holy environment of the Pacific Jewish Center. And then there's this topless girl going by. And she was like a six or a seven. I mean, she was she was attractive, and according to peer-reviewed scientific studies, uh, women who are sexes but who roller skate public topless, they are empirically verified as sevens. So maybe she was, you know, even harder than than she really was, just because I, I don't know. You don't see that many topless women roller skating in in, uh, in Venice these days. Is there something I'm missing? In Australia, you used to have a lot of bathing beauties who would who would go topless. About a third, all right, of attractive women between say eighteen and uh, thirty would would go topless in Australia. But uh, that pretty much died out in the early nineteen nineties. So I was recently back in in Australia for two months. I did not see one pair of tits. And here I am walking down the Venice boardwalk yesterday, and topless woman goes by. And there were police around. So I'm not sure, is that, uh, is that legal now in Los Angeles? I, I'm kind of proud of myself. I went to the beach. I hung out with, with a friend, went a walkabout, spent about four and a half hours at the beach, and I did take one picture. I didn't go, go make, make one video, but I was sorely tempted to go make a video when there are all these plaques for blacks on Pico Boulevard and 4th Street. So there are a series of plaques about the contributions of black people to Santa Monica, which is not a particularly black area. But apparently there were a tiny number of black people in the early history of Santa Monica. They suffered racial discrimination. And there, were, there was a black doctor and a black dentist that moved to Santa Monica in the 1930s. And I, I would expect that in the 1930s, this was prior to affirmative action. So I would expect say, prior to the 1960s, that if you got a black doctor or a black dentist, statistically speaking, on average, they're probably more likely to be competent than, than the average, say, white doctor. But now that we've got massive amounts of affirmative action, so that seven out of eight blacks who get into medical school, according to, the, to recent surveys, have benefited from affirmative action. So now there's this widespread 
instinctive, you know, knee-jerk belief that if you get a black professional, that they're less likely to be competent due to widespread affirmative action. But a few decades ago, uh, I would expect the average person would have thought that their, their black professional would have been more likely to be competent than the average because there was not this affirmative action uh, giving, you know, giving a big hand up and uh, putting, putting a foot on the scale. All human beings who have true moral agency in the you know, complete sense of the term are white males. And everybody else is somehow compromised, victimized, oppressed, persecuted, you know, lacks control, lacks efficacy. Lacks There's agency. There's something less. Yes. There's less agency. That's They're really just the actors in our play. Up. I mean, exactly. that's what they're really saying. And it's it's your play. <laughs> it's like, too. Sorry, not to get far afield. Uh, well, that's not far afield. That's the, that's the center of it. So so what happens? So you write this piece in the Inquirer in Philadelphia. People don't like it. What did the administration at Penn say? Well, you know, the way these things always play out um, is through, you know, the infectious media. I mean, social media just is so critical to how these things happen. Yes. Uh, a bunch of students get hold of this. They gin up some outrage. They, of course, go running to... Yeah, so the, the most activists, all right, ha have the most power, all right? Uh, Moses's reforms for the Jewish way of life 3,200 years ago weren't overwhelmingly popular, but because his supporters were so hardcore, they essentially cowed the rest of Israel in, into following. And when much of Israel wanted to participate in idolatry, it was, it was the hardcore that uh, said, no, 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 you, you can't go that way. So you don't see a lot of comics making fun of Islam because there's a hardcore of Muslims who really don't appreciate that. There's no reform Islam. There's no conservative you know, Islam. There's only orthodox Islam because the adherents of Islam are so hardcore that they intimidate uh, anyone who wants to make you know a more watered down version. So this isn't just something that occurs on college campuses. This is just it's the it's the veto of the dedicated five percent or ten percent. You get you get a dedicated five or ten percent of a particular group dedicated to some proposition, and they will consistently prevail over the ninety to ninety five percent who oppose them, but who are not nearly as dedicated. So yeah, I was at the beach yesterday, and there were quite a few fit white women and some of them, I saw a group of them, they had headphones on and they were like dancing with each other. See, I, can, I grew up a Seventh-day Adventist. So dancing is a sin in the Seventh-day Adventist approach to life. And then I converted to Orthodox Judaism where you only dance with blokes. So I am only comfortable dancing with other blokes. But I, I have a dream, God forbid, that I meet a woman who teaches me how to disco dance or, or, or dance to, to rock and roll music. Obviously, it's a sin and I mean, maybe it's it'd be permitted with your wife. So I, I need to find a wife who will teach me how to dance because I have so many hangouts with regard to, to dancing. I'm mean, just so awkward and, and maladjusted. But I just kind of envied them. Like they they were there with their headphones on and grooving and dancing with each other on the beach and they look so fit. It's like when I go to a party and like women are greeting each other. It's like, oh, hey, baby. And like jumping, you know, into each other's hands or in arms and, and I was sitting back thinking, oh, this is not very intellectual. But as my therapist pointed out, you know, maybe you wanted people to squeal and, and jump for joy when, when they see you too. So, yeah, I saw these hot, fit white women on the Santa Monica Venice Beach. It was a very beautiful sight. Okay, what else? So, yeah, big Sunday. All right. And... uh Want to talk about Elon Musk uh, buying a substantial part of Twitter, but deciding not to join the the board of Twitter? Maybe Elon Musk will open up uh, some more free speech on Twitter and bring Donald Trump back. I'll discuss that later in the show. The dean and to the powers that be at school, you know, Big Daddy and friends, and they complain, uh, "This is hurtful. This is harmful. This makes us un unsafe." This is, you know, degrading to us. Do something, do something. You have to discipline this person. You have to get rid of them. You have to fire them. And of course, the complainers have no concept of academic freedom. 
they're completely oblivious to it, um, to, you know, freedom of expression. I mean, free speech doesn't technically apply. Pretty much everyone is oblivious to everything that is not interesting to them. So let's say I spent much of my time uh, dreaming that I was going to become a great and successful YouTube host one day. I would, I would interpret all evidence through that lens that I just have to you know, unleash my natural gifts and then thousands of people are going to flock to my show. I, I wouldn't be living in reality. I wouldn't be con confronting the, the, the type of shows that I like to do and not likely to have mass appeal. No, I'm much more likely to live in delusion. And so uh, people don't think about other people, right? People don't think about you nearly as much as you think about you. And so empathy is a cognitive ability. And there is a test that measures one's ability for empathy, and that is IQ. And uh, Amy Wax, we're talking someone with like a 160 IQ. So yeah, she is capable of far more empathy than these you know, 120 IQ students. But these 120 IQ students, they're not an anomaly. This is just how human beings act, right? Do you think that uh, Orthodox Jews go around deeply concerned about uh, the fate of, of Christians or of non-Jews? No, Orthodox Jews are primarily concerned about the welfare of Orthodox Jews. Seventh-day Adventists are primarily concerned about the welfare of Seventh-day Adventists. People don't tend to think about other people very much. It's not just a crazy college student thing. Apply to a professor at a private university, which is what I am. They don't even understand that. Uh, but there are, is this core of academic values that, you know. They're not trying to understand that. They're trying to have a good time. They're trying to gain points for, for being an activist. They're trying to reach for prestige and, and to appear to be an anti-racism leader. Like I see people all around me in my social class who you know, want to publish op-eds about the stands they took against racism. Right? People react to incentives. These students are reacting to incentives. There's not much incentive in, in America in 2022 for academic freedom. There's much more incentive to be an anti-racism crusader. Right? So these kids are just reacting to incentives, to incentives to the world that we have created for them largely as a result of 1965 civil rights legislation. Well, is supposed to be at the center of why we're here and what we do, uh, that a lot of people pay lip service. Academic freedom is not at the center of students' lives, right? What's at the center of students' lives is getting drunk, getting laid, getting through class, and then for... for a minority, it's really important to them to get high grades so that they can get a good job. And academic freedom is not a leading concern for 99% of students, not now, not ever. Too. You would think the students would understand that, but they don't. But actually, it wasn't just the students who wrote these petitions, uh, but the faculty also was upset, a, a number of the faculty. But it's such a... Yeah, the, the faculty and the students are reacting to a system. They're reacting to incentives that have been largely put in place by 1965 civil rights legislation, right? People react to incentives, right? Institutions and groups, right? And legislation and things often outside of our unconscious control have a tremendous effect on us. Weird inversion, just to touch on the students for a sec. They're students. They're there to learn, not to teach. Like how many students do you think go to university with the primary purpose of learning? No, they, they go there to party. They go there because it's expected. And they go there so that they can get a good job. Their job isn't to tell deans the way the world is. Their job is to absorb from the deans and the faculty the way the world Right? That's the whole point. So why didn't any dean say, shut up, kid? Like, I'm not interested. You know, just shut up. Like, you're not qualified on this. I'm in charge. Like, nobody would ever assert that authority anymore. Oh, Tucker, I have been saying this forever. I have been saying the solution to this whole debacle of the cancel culture and the intimidation on campus is so simple. It's just for deans and university presidents to exert their authority yes. and say, I'm sorry, your complaint is illegitimate. It's stupid, yeah. You know, uh, there's nothing. So we live in the United States of America where there is an ethic that the consumer is always right. The customer is always right. 
you may not like it, but students are the customers of universities, right? So it's not surprising that there's a mentality on the behalf of universities that does not want to confront their customers and tell them that they're wrong. That's not usually a winning business strategy. Nothing I can do. There's nothing I should do. Faculty do this. They express their opinion. They're there for that purpose. Um, sorry, you're just going to have to get over it. I, I really, the number of university presidents or deans who have reacted in that way, and there have been multiple incidents like this all across the country, well, can be counted on you know, half of one hand. But it's not just the deans, it's like the guys at J.P. Morgan and at the Pentagon and everywhere. And I have to say, there's a gender component that the majority of people we have on who are dissidents in the face of this stuff are women. That's just true. Yeah, no, that's true. There's it is. a feminization it's... of outrage that is but, quite No, disturbing. no, no, but like all, the, the majority of oh, people the majority we have that you, who I say, I'm not, I'm not doing this, I'm not going along with whatever it is. Oh. Where are, like, are there any... I'm sorry to say it, but are there any men left, like anywhere, who are just saying, no, there's a limit and here's what it is, and no offense, but we're not doing that? Well, not people in positions of, of real authority. And I think the reason for that is that to get to be a university president, to get to be a dean, you have to jump through these filtering hoops that ensure that you're, that you're not a renegade. <laughs> right. That you've, you know, you're right. You've had your balls cut off. Excuse the crudity. No, but it's, you're right. You've been gelded. You have been, male or female. And, you know, the filter is a very good one. You well, very... so then, okay, so you went to Yale Law School and medical school, right? Uh, Harvard Medical School. <laughs> I went to you're making my point. So Har here's... Har Harvard Law School and Harvard Medical School. Oh, that's unbelievable. Yale yeah. undergrad. Right. In biochemistry? Right. Right, okay. So there's kind of no achievement on the ladder that you haven't gotten. And now you're a professor at Penn Law School. So you know the system that we use to raise up the next generation of leaders very well because you succeeded in it. And I wonder if you ever have second thoughts about that system and whether it produces the kind of people you need to run a country. Well, Tucker, you have to understand that things have changed drastically. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the change has been rapid and dramatic. When I was an undergrad, I graduated from college in 1975. It was a completely different world. Yale in the early 70s was not a place that apologized for its existence. Yeah. Okay, It was a proud place that uh, carried forward or tried very hard to carry forward old traditions, you know, of dead white male achievement, and it was largely dead white male achievement. I mean, obviously there were other contributions, but there was no attempt to try to even it out. Uh, we were going to study Western Civ, and we were going to venerate and respect Western Western Civ is a, a cuck term for Christendom, all right? So Western Civ that is proudly, yeah, proudly masculine term that we're going to stand up for, for its excellence. Uh, Western, all right, Western civilization, that's a compromise with Christendom. Uh, we, we, we started talking about Western civilization in the last 60 years so that we could include Jews, all right? The, the traditional term has been Christendom. So I would have liked to have heard us say Christendom. ...and recognize how important that legacy was to where we are today. I mean, that was the understanding. Uh, and women were expected, the women who were new on the scene at Yale, they had just been admitted, were expected to conform to these quote unquote male standards of intellectual rigor, of objectivity, of empiricism, and you know, all of the post enlightenment traditions and values and practices that we associated with the great universities. Um, there was, the word diversity just was on no one's lips. I mean, there were students from minority groups, uh, but they were also expected to achieve along the same lines as everybody else. Look, in the 1950s, Judaism was included as one of America's three great religions, right? That became de rigueur, even though Jews 
didn't even account for 3% of the American population. So there have been plenty of Jews who've been playing this diversity game. It's not just a Jewish thing. It's not just a black thing or a Puerto Rican thing. Individuals, groups are constantly trying to position themselves for their own advantage, right? So Jews wanted to open America up so that we no longer said, you know, A no domino, AD or BC. We said, say, BCE and CE before the common era and common era. Instead of saying Christendom, we say Western civilization. We, we make uh, Judaism one of the three great religions of the United States of America when there's really only Christianity has been the dominant religion. So groups are, have long been playing these games. Um, so, and the, the other fact about Yale in the early 70s, and I've recently been on a listserv where this has been discussed, is that we had a bare bones, pared down administrative apparatus. I mean, it was 95% academics. That's what Yale was about. And everything else, the mechanics. This is all a consequence of the 1965 civil rights legislation. HR departments did not, were not so huge prior to 1965, all right? HR departments, these type of administration departments have all had to vastly expand because civil rights legislation has effectively repealed the original constitution, which allowed for freedom of association, installed a whole new constitution where you don't get freedom of association and where the simple fact of having different numbers of groups in different areas, you know, makes you much more vulnerable to a lawsuit. And so as a rational response to civil rights legislation, you have the growth of administrations, you have the growth of HR departments, right? Do you think big business is just so devoted to critical race theory and to sexual harassment training and the like? No, they want to make money. But if you have, you know, racial sensitivity training, sexual sensitivity, sexual harassment training, you reduce your legal liability, right? The reason that universities have all these administrators, have all this affirmative action, have, and there are all these, you know, bloated HR departments, it's, it's all to reduce legal liability and to fit in with the world that was created by 1960 civil rights legislation. So she's talking as though this is just some unfathomable, irrational behavior on the part of, of faculties and on behalf of students and on behalf of universities when everyone reacts to incentives. The of operating Yale was handled by a very small group of people, including academic advising, our dean of students. Um, you know, you would talk to them once or twice in a semester. Uh, so guess what? The more you subsidize something, the more you get of it, right? The federal government has been subsidizing higher education on a massive degree. And so in response to all this massive government funding and with the funding always comes oversight, you have the growth of the administrative state, right? This is not just something to do with universities. You have overall the increasing power of the administrative state, which is largely beyond uh, legal challenge, executive challenge, and legislature challenge. If the DMV makes a rule that you don't like, generally speaking, you can't sue in court and the executive, the president or the governor can't take them down and the legislature by and large can't, can't take them down. We have an administrative state. We don't have any alternatives in the first world to the administrative state. If you think the administrative state sucks, and I think there are many valid criticisms of the administrative state, then show me a flourishing, prosperous first world nation that doesn't have an administrative state, right? This is, this is just what comes with an advanced economy. You have this massive administrative state it applies to universities, it applies to uh, corporations, it, it applies uh, to, to unions, right? Life becomes increasingly bureaucratized. It becomes increasingly regulated, right? We have far more laws, far more regulations, and far more restrictions on our freedom now than five years ago, than 10 years ago, than 15 years ago, than 20 years ago, than 30 years ago. There's this inevitable march of the administrative state, which has not been turned back significantly anywhere in the first world of which I'm aware. Uh, they had a secretary and that was it. There was no diversity, inclusion and equity apparatus. So I just uh, signed up for Fox Nation. I, I got a one year deal for like less than $40. I think it was even 
less than $33. So how can you beat that a year of Fox Nation for less than a dollar, less than a dollar a week? And I pay $3 a week for CNN Plus. So I probably got like 12 subscriptions running. Of course, I've got Netflix and, uh, you know, Amazon Prime, LA Times, New York Times, ESPN Plus, The Athletic, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal. Yes, there weren't these dozens and dozens and dozens of people doing heaven knows what. Tucker making mischief really is what well, they course. do right now. You know, just gin making mischief is what we say when we don't want to ha have some empathy and, and try to understand how other people are responding to incentives just as we do. Now, look, I have frequently been an absolute pig with, with regard to women and with regard to men as well, right? I have behaved so badly, so rudely, so inconsiderately, so selfishly. But do you think I want to look at that? Do you think I want to talk about that? Uh, that I remember there was some woman who years after I cornered her in a kitchen at a Shabbat dinner and, and you know, put the hard word on her, who was like still crying about it. Right. You know, I don't know how many women I've traumatized. I don't know how many guys I've traumatized. All right. But I don't want to think about that. Like, I don't want to think about the negative effect I've had on others. It takes a lot of effort to think about why are other people behaving the way they do. But people are trying to do the best they can. And we're all just responding to incentives. So if you want to actually make a difference in the topics that she's discussing, you have to understand get to the bottom of these incentives that are causing people to act in ways you find unproductive. Spinning up problems that justify their existence. We didn't have those people at all. And as a result, it was a lot cheaper. I mean, I remember, <laughs> I remember my, my dad saying, holy heck, they're charging four thousand dollars for tuition at this place you know every semester that's a lot of money well it seemed like a lot of money at the time uh but it's most of the world's great universities are in america so american universities certainly have their share of problems but they're simply the best in the world by far all right uh, approximately what, nine out of 10 of the world's top universities are American, probably 18 of the top 20, probably 45 of the top 50. So America's universities have their problems. These are all accurate criticisms, but compared to what, right? I live on planet Earth, right? You think it sucks in America. You think the American university sucks. Then where is it better? You think things are better in China? You think things are better in Nigeria? You think things are significantly better in France or Germany or Sweden or Australia? or Iceland, or Ireland, or Scotland. No, they're not. World's best universities are overwhelmingly American for all their problems. Nothing compared to what they're no. charging now. And, and why are they charging it? Take a list of, uh, take a look at the- Because they can, right? It's just uh, supply and demand. When I went to UCLA, I think there were more applications to, to go to UCLA than any other university in the country. It's a great university. It's a great place to be. There's enormous demand for a good university education. A list of uh, DIE, diversity, equity, and inclusion type people at University of Michigan, for example, which recently appeared. Regardless of whether Bangladesh or Niger are, are worse. Okay, so you can choose to take that attitude as like, oh, it just sucks. But uh, sucking is, is relative, right? If there aren't... attitude that, that you know america just sucks man right america's got problems but uh, overall it's the world's leader it's the dominant superpower and it will become only more dominant in the decades ahead so if you're going to say america sucks then where do you think it's better and why don't you move there if you think it's so much better elsewhere online on someone's twitter account dozens and dozens and dozens of people making tens of thousands of dollars, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Unclear duties, you know, unknown purpose. Just I remember when I worked construction, I made something like four, five, six dollars an hour, 650, I think was the, 
the max. This was 1985, 86, 87, 88, right? And yet there are other people who made $20 an hour in construction. All they did was ride around with the boss, right? So some people are just better skilled at finding those sweet jobs. I was swinging a pick and a shovel in 100 degree Sacramento heat for like $5 an hour when other people were riding around in air conditioned cars and all they had to do was be a pleasant company for their boss. So some people figure out how to do you know, the, the sweet things, right? You're into sweetness. There are opportunities if you want to roll that way. Just there, a welfare for the upper middle class is yes. really what it is. And of course, what happens? Parents, you know, are desperate to put together the money to send their kids to these prestigious universities. They take out enormous loans. They co-sign those loans. Uh, and there's no hope that a lot of these students will ever pay them back. I mean, there's, of course, a push now to stick the taxpayer with the bill, of course, which is a... So she keeps talking as though what's happening is just completely irrational. Why was it when I moved to Los Angeles in 1994 and I opened up the LA Weekly and other help wanted sections in newspapers and I saw there were all these ads for actors and models, how did I then get taken for thousands of dollars worth of scams? Because I was unconsciously a willing participant, right? The scam offered me the illusion that I could have an acting or a modeling career. And so I jumped for it. People sign up for these elite university educations that rationally they can't afford because it feeds an illusion that they can then become elite, that, uh, that their life path will be smoothed over, right? So it's not surprising that people will spend tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars and get into astronomical amounts of debt to feed a delusion, right? People do that buying homes they can't afford, uh, settling down with a spouse that they can't afford. It, this is part of the human condition. It's just so easy to do what Amy Wax is doing here. It's just like you know, sitting back, decrying the, the, the sins of the world and just you know how stupid and irrational everyone is. Instead, she could spend a little bit of cognitive empathy and talk about why things are the way they are and how people are just rationally responding to incentives and human beings do not live on bread alone. People want to feel important, right? People have delusions, all right? We, we all have delusions and then we all filter reality through the prism of, of our delusions. And being an elite person is a dream for many, for many parents, for many kids. And so they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars that they can't afford to feed this delusion. It's just how people work. It's not something that's unique to universities. A subsidy for the college educated class that, you know, truck drivers and uh, delivery drivers are going to be paying. Yes. Uh, that's just the most regressive thing you can possibly imagine is discharging these student loans. Uh, but this is really what we have bought. We have bought a bloated, wildly expensive education establishment where the rate. I, I agree with pretty much everything she's saying, but you can tell by a very flat affect that she has just made these complaints a thousand times, right? There's no, there's no aliveness in, in her delivery because she said it a thousand times. I remember when I went for a voice lesson my first voice lesson and my my teacher was trying to teach me how to resonate from a higher place in the back of my throat and so she just asked me various questions when i was answering all these questions my voice was fairly flat she could she picked up on it and she said oh you've talked about this you know a hundred times before haven't you it's like yes right there's a certain quality to the voice when you said things you know 200 times and so tucker carlson's getting sloppy seconds here like he's not just getting sloppy seconds he's getting sloppy three hundredths because she's said all these things 300 times. She is bored by what she's saying because she said it so many times. And I've invited her on my show where she could get to have a new experience, right? Where she wouldn't just get the same old questions and just tread out the same old answers. Like I worked hard to get her on my show and she was thinking about coming on my show, but she, she's always backed out uh, of coming on my show. Uh, she could come on my show and have a new experience and she wouldn't have to just retread the same tired lines she's given 500 times before. Ratio of administrators to teachers 
rises on a yearly basis. And that's the difference between now, Tucker, and back when I was in college. It's night and day. It's amazing. So under all of this is the failure of self-confidence. You, you described Yale when you went there in the early 70s as a place that was proud of itself, thought it had something worth passing on. Right. Um, that's not the case now. So this is how it was back you know, when I went to university. Guess what? There were certain things that were better about life at universities in the 1960s than today. There are other things that are better today, right? Uh, life in 2022 has its problems. There are some ways that life in 1452 was better. There are some ways that life in 1952 was better, right? Some things are better now. Some things are better then. But uh, we're not living in a dystopia right now. Now, and so maybe as a result of that, affirmative action, this idea that what we're doing is basically illegitimate until we, quote, diversify. And uh, Glib Medley says that uh, Amy Wax would be good with Ed Dutton. Hey, what am I? Am I chop me? You don't think that I would bring, bring out the best in Amy Wax? You think that Ed Dutton w would do a better interview with Amy Wax than I would? Buy it. That's kind of the reigning idea, so far as I can tell. Um, you address this pretty directly, I would say, in a conversation with Glenn Lowry, 2017, on Blogging Heads TV. I want to play it for our viewers who haven't seen it. This was a pivot point in your life, I would say. Here we go. Take, you know, Penn Law School or some top 10 law school. You know, here's a very inconvenient fact, Glenn. I, I don't think I've ever seen a black student graduate in the top quarter of the class and rarely, rarely in the top half. I can think of one or two students who've scored in the top half in my required first year course. Well, what are we supposed to do about that? That you're really, um, you're, you're putting in front of this person a real uphill battle. And if they were better matched, uh, it might be a better environment for them. So there are two parts to that um, statement, which grows out of your firsthand observations as a, as a professor. Uh, the first is just a statement of, of fact. You said, I don't think I've ever seen a black student graduate in the top quarter of the class and rarely, rarely in the top half. OK, so that's right, because the elite black students, they don't go to the University of Pennsylvania because they could get into Harvard and Stanford and Berkeley and the University of Chicago and Columbia and Yale. They're all going to better universities than the University of Pennsylvania. Something that's speaking of empiricism, that's an empirical observation made by you. And the second is an expression of compassion for the students that you're talking about. You say, this is bad for them. It, I don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but let's go to the first one. Well, there's an irony here, which is that, you know, what I say about blacks rarely graduating at the top of the class, and here I'm specifically drawing on my experience as a teacher of a large first year class uh, in which I, you know, have seen all the data, every single bit of it for 15 years of where students are in the class. And on the basis of that, but also my attendance at graduation and my service on the clerkship committee, where we see students ranked uh, quite explicitly in order to try to place them in clerkships, all of that teaches me that black students tend to clump in the bottom half of the class and actually it's and when you look at the clerkships for the leading liberal supreme court justices they have almost no blacks that they allow to clerk for them right so they're all for affirmative action but not for for themselves it's worse than that in my civil procedure class they would clump towards the bottom 10 percent of the class or 15 percent of the class occasionally people would break out of that and even make it into the top. But what's ironic? And often university professors and college teachers and high school teachers have passed struggling minority students because they simply don't want to deal with the consequences of failing them. So when you make it hard for people to fail you, then yeah, you can intimidate people into passing you and you can then try to swim at, at a level that is just way above you. Here and I, you know, this is a, very roundabout way of putting it, is that this 
This pattern has been well known in law schools for decades. It, no one. So I know a lot of lawyers and pretty much every lawyer is that I've known is, is race realist. They don't have the same expectation for a Japanese client or a Chinese client or a Mexican client or a black client or a white client. They expect that the Japanese American client is going to be more prepared than the average white client. They expect that the Japanese American client is going to be more educated to earn more money to be more likely to be on time and to be polite and to be well presented than the average white client. And they also have certain expectations about, you know, different types of white people needs to be different types of Mexicans and different types of Latinos and different types of black people. So pretty much every lawyer I know is fairly realistic about race. Seriously doubts that black students tend to underachieve in law schools that practice affirmative action, selective law schools. Uh, a professor named Richard Sander at UCLA published a law review article, I think it was in Stanford, it may have been in another law review, in which he uh, just lays out the data that he obtained from a number of law schools. Of course, now it would be almost impossible to get that data um, that showed that, you know, that showed that there was not an even distribution of grades. Now, you know, it, they made such a big deal out of it, but it's really not that big a deal in the following sense, Tucker. You know, you could argue about the pros and cons of affirmative action. Well, look, uh, the distribution of blacks in law school is no different than the distribution of whites in the NBA or the NFL. Uh, there aren't a lot of Asian players in uh, the NBA. Or the NFL, I mean, is that because of systemic racism? Is it because different groups have different gifts, right? There, there weren't any great Catholic physicists who were important to the Manhattan Project, right? All the physicists were, were Protestant or Jewish. When I discussed this with Glenn Lowry, it was not... There are no Protestants on the U.S. Supreme Court, right? Law does not have the same importance to Protestants as it does to Catholics and to Jews. Right? The U.S. Supreme Court, it's all Catholics and Jews for a nation that is long being primarily Protestant. Not along the lines of, well, this shows that we should just get rid of affirmative action. I mean, this fact alone means that affirmative action is a disaster. That was not the gist of the conversation. The gist of the conversation was, you know, there are upsides and downsides to affirmative action. And one of the downsides is that, you know, blacks have a hard time when they're overmatched by their classmates, which is the whole point of affirmative action, right? Um, doing really well academically. That's that's one. Well, the downside. context of this, I mean, the clip that we just played was again one of of empathy. You're saying it's not good for these students. I think it's hard. I think it is very hard for them, um, and it can be. I mean, is it any different than, say, a football team or a basketball team that is forced to take on white or Asian students rather than simply the best student athletes? Moralizing, but that to me is not a slam dunk. Now, I happen to be opposed to affirmative action. I've become more opposed, and I can explain why. Tell me why. Uh, the reason I've become more opposed to affirmative action is because I think it has poisoned the entire academic enterprise. It is like this poison that, you know, you drop into a well and it just spreads everywhere and goes through all the pipes and there's no place all the capillaries. that's not, yeah. Yeah, all the capillaries, all the tiniest little, yeah. uh, you know, end point. It's similar to affirmative action for athletes when University of Washington had something like the number two ranked football team in the nation in year 2000. Half the squad had been arrested or investigated for, for serious crimes like rape and attempted murder, just awful things. But law enforcement and school administration had uh, worked together to essentially get a free pass for the student athlete criminals points of, of where the water... I, I remember when I was at UCLA and a lot of the football players would, would eat in my Reber Hall dormitory. It was, it was just some really bad behavior. They would you know, throw food around, just awful, awful behavior. I remember in high school, often uh, athletes did not have to take tests, all right, if they had had a, a long training session the, the, the night before. So 
uh, athletes often get get preferential treatment in, in schools and are not held accountable to the same work levels that everyone else is held accountable to. Water goes. That's that's an analogy. And what do I mean by that? I think if you were to look at the orthodoxy, at the accepted narrative, at the priorities of academia today, which is diversity above everything else and safe spaces and psychological comfort for minority students uh, and disadvantaged minorities especially, or underachieving minorities, we'll never call them that. Um, that is the most important thing. And anybody who says anything about groups or about race or about um, different populations that would in any way upset someone who is a minority, probably in many cases here because of affirmative action, that person uh, needs to be punished. And it just affects everything that people study, the sorts of opinions that they can express, what you're allowed. Well, you can say the same sort of thing about America as a whole. You can't discuss any major issue in America without asking very quickly, how does this affect black people? So whether it's homelessness, uh, education, public education, educational standards, crime, law enforcement, policing, uh, public safety, housing regulations, uh, who, who gets to take out a mortgage? Should we have affirmative action in, in mortgage lending? Pretty much every public policy, uh, first of all, the, the dominant question is, how will this affect black people? Not really a strong recipe for for building a productive and cohesive society. To say what you're not allowed to say, it all comes back to hiding the fact right. that some groups are more competitive than others, that there is this academic achievement gap that has not gone away. And because of it, we now have everywhere in academia, not just double standards, Tucker. Look, we, we've only spent several trillion dollars trying to close the gap. You know, I think if we just throw another 10 trillion at it, we'll, we'll get it sorted. But a wholesale attack on well, standards. Well, that's it right there. That's right. It's an right? attack on the idea of achievement, even. So. Achievement of merit, of standards, of any kind of objective metric of, you know, who's more competent or capable than someone else. That whole system has got to go. It is under attack. Now, if that's not the poison seeping into the capillaries, I don't know what well, is. Well, if you have schools arguing against education, which is essentially what they're doing now, then you kind of lost the thread, right? I mean, right? Well, I mean, they they're, they say they're for education, but what they're really for is indoctrination. Well, no, but I mean, there are school districts around the country, Washington State, Oregon, for example, California, where they've said, you know, we're, we're just not studying this because certain people aren't doing well enough, and it's, well, so right. we're just giving it up. We're, we're against learning now. <laughs> we're against grammar. I mean, it's pretty scary, right? Right. Anything where one group does worse than another or the outcomes. Of course, this is part of this broader focus on equalizing. Well, no, it's not anything where one group does worse than another. So there are consistently fewer men going to college and that's not a, a big concern. Uh, it's well known in education that women and girls are much better at coloring between the lines, that men are much more likely to be rambunctious, that uh, we, don't, we don't have many classes in, in military history. And, and classes that boys would find interesting. Our, our whole educational systems become highly feminized, highly slanted towards uh, female success rather than the male success. So no, there are favored groups in certain situations. So it's not that uh, we always want equal outcomes because there are all sorts of outcomes where women in our society do far better than men. And that's not considered widely a very bad thing. That's considered, you know, uh, not worthy of discussion. Outcomes on equity. It's just of an important branch of the whole equity project, which is all outcomes for all groups. Yeah, I'm not endorsing any hate speech. I, I'm just showing this for educational purposes. It's like pornography. Must be the same. And if they're not, then the only explanation for it is some kind of evil, nefarious racism.
you know, and so what do we do about it? Well, in the education sphere, we say, well, let's get rid of all the subjects where, you know, some people learn it better than others or some people get better grades than others. You know, let's just let's get rid of calculus because blacks do relatively poorly with calculus or they struggle with calculus or they choose not to study calculus. Well, just dump it. Right. That that's the sort of thing that's going on. Certainly dump uh, anything associated with white values, European accomplishments, Western Civ. Dump uh, what exactly are white values? I don't think she's on very solid ground there. I mean, I guess you could make the case in the United States of America that whites, generally speaking, vote for lower taxes and stronger law enforcement and the removal of affirmative action. But uh, what, what are white values? I, I think that's, that's a misstep. Dump all of that because not only does that lead to unequal outcomes, but it also has that added effect of, you know, implying that some things are more worth studying than others. Right. If you're studying the, you know, the history of Rome, you have to study the history of Sierra Leone, too. Right. Right. Or, you know, some other obscure place. Right. Um, how is that different from vandalism? It just seems like people coming in and wrecking everything that was valuable in an institution that they never built themselves. It's very reckless and destructive. Um, it's very vindictive. It's, it's, it's very angry. Yeah. Uh, I, Where does I, that anger come from, do you think? I, I think there is just a tremendous amount of resentment and shame of non-Western peoples against Western peoples for Western peoples outsized achievements and contributions. I, I mean, this is something Steve Saylor talks about a lot, but if you're going to say something as incendiary as this, so this is what was picked up by Media Matters today and blasted all over Twitter and the internet. If you're going to say incendiary things, you should step back and think, is there a way that I can phrase this so that more people can hear what I'm saying? And second, what's subjective evidence? And you're not going to find objective evidence that uh, non-Western people uh, just uh, hate Western achievement and hate know white people because they achieve so highly i'm sure there are some non-whites who hate whites for, for achieving just as there are plenty of whites who hate whites but i don't think she is on strong ground objectively or statistically and if you're going to throw these incendiary you know molotov cocktails then you got to endure a tremendous blowback that's unnecessary you could just rephrase things in ways that people could hear more effectively. I mean, it's really unbearable. I was actually, you know, leaving aside American blacks who I think do feel that resentment and, and shame. Some do. Do you, do you really think 60%, 70%, you really think 80% of American blacks just resent white people and resent Western civilization? I don't. I think maybe 2% do, 3%. But she's talking as though this is a generalized black phenomenon. I don't think she's right. Shame and envy. I mean, it's this unholy brew of sentiments. I was talking to Glenn Lowry about this bizarre. Right. I mean, she's saying these incendiary things that are unnecessary. You could phrase things in ways that people could hear. And she doesn't have any empirical evidence or she'd be citing it. She's just channeling Steve Saylor. Fact that um, Asian and South Asian Indian uh, doctors at Penn Med, which I, you know, know, I know people there and I know what's going on there, that they're on the ramparts for the anti-racism initiative for dump on America. America is an evil racist. Right, because those are the incentives that white people have set up, right? White people have made it cool to dump on white people and to dump on Western civilization and to dump on, on Christianity, right? These other minority groups are in large part simply responding to the incentives that white people have created. It's, there's nothing essential, intrinsic, and inherent in South Asians that they hate white people, right? South Asians overall are among the most Pacific people around. This place, how these are it, immigrants. It, the number one highest income group in America right. is- Hate America. 
Right. A goodly number of so, them. But not you're all. from a group. I mean, first of all, I hate even thinking in terms of groups anyway. A, a goodly number of, of South Asians just hate America. A, a, and, and the evidence for this is, is what? That you've got a prominent South Asian activist here or there at uh, University of Penn Med School? Because what matters is the individual, obviously. But as long as we are, if you're a member of the highest income, highest achievement group in America, and you're looking down another group, native born whites, for example, and saying you're the problem, like how does that work exactly? Well, that is uh, to me utterly bizarre and fascinating. And why does anybody put up with that? Right. I'm not saying all, no, all I've Indian immigrants are this I've way. I'm just it. saying you look at the roster of, you know, who's leading the programs, you know, the endless number of programs where they talk about diversity and... Okay, so now she's coming alive. All right, now she's saying things that she hasn't said a thousand times. Unfortunately, she's speaking as though she was at a bar uh, talking to a friend, all right? You're going to speak this, this way. One, you shouldn't. You should perhaps rephrase so that more people can hear you. And two, you need to be citing evidence. And she's not citing any evidence beyond anecdotes, which is not convincing. Racism and all the racism that people have to encounter in medicine and how racist medicine is and all this. And you see these brown faces or you see these Asian faces and you think, I mean, literally you think, so you're coming from your country, which you're implying it has you know, a freaking is equal or system. better than our country. <laughs> literally. And you're telling us how awful we are well, what's the explanation for that? China's an ethno state, by the way, which of no course. one ever says. It's about the Han Chinese. And if you're not, that's, that's the problem with the Uyghurs. That's their religion. They're not Han Chinese. Yeah, well, uh, China is about 92% Han Chinese, right? It's not surprising that a country that's 92% Han Chinese is a Han Chinese state. Whatever. I'm not even judging. I'm just saying people from there have no right to judge the United States. As but they, they very much feel that they do. And so take, you know, the Brahmin women who come from India and they climb the ladder, they get the best education, we give them every opportunity, and they turn around and lead the charge on, on we're, we're racist, we're an awful country. We yeah, and what percentage of, of Brahmin women are doing this, right? You're talking at most, you know, 0.1%, but she's talking as though it's 70% of them. Need reform, our medical system needs reform. Well, here's the problem. They're taught that they are better than everybody else because they are Brahmin elites. Every group instinctively believes that they're better than everyone else. Jews do, Christians do, Muslims do, blacks do, whites do. Uh, this is just part of human nature. And yet, on some level, their country is a shithole. Excuse my language. No, yeah. Okay, it, it's not providing them with the opportunities that they feel that they deserve and which in many cases they, they do deserve. They come here and they see that we have this. And uh, Two Cents makes a, a great point. Luke is a moderate now. Yeah, like uh, many intellectuals or wannabe intellectuals, I am frequently engaged in the performance of positioning. All right. I, I want to position myself in, in a, a certain area where life will be cool, calm, and collected and easy for me. All right. I, I don't want to position myself in front of the machine guns. So Jean-Paul Sartre, all right, he condemned artists who didn't take a moral stand to try to make himself look more moral because he was taking a moral stand during World War II against Nazism. Then after World War II, he came up with, you know, help contribute to the popularizing of existentialism, which was the, you know, one widespread uh, philosophical movement. But as soon as other people got on board with existentialism, that made him less special. So he had to go, you know, invent something else. So, yeah, I, like other YouTubers and like you, you know, I'm constantly positioned myself, constantly engaging in some kind of perform performance to position myself this way or that way to make my life better. Right. We all do that. We're all kind of squinting at our life and trying to think, OK, you know, in what in what perspective am I totally cool? Or, you know, how can I position myself to make my life better? So I absolutely plead guilty to that kind of performance. This wonderful developed scientific and medical establishment, which they haven't managed to create, uh, they realize that, you know, we've outgunned and outclassed them in practically every way. And 
What do they feel? Well, they're very proud people. They're a shame culture. And they feel anger. They feel envy. They feel shame. I think the role of, of envy and shame in the way that the third world regards the first world is underestimated. I think you're exactly right. I think you're exactly right. It's never right. talked about. No, and you've been... Um really penalized for talking about it. And it so. creates ingratitude of the most monstrous kind. I feel like... Notice how, how alive she is now, right? The last three minutes, she is alive. Asking some of these people, like, why did you leave your country? Why are you here? Um, I Have am, you asked that? Uh, well, it would be considered not just a microaggression. Tucker, it would be considered a macroaggression. You don't ask people that sort of thing. Why? Well. Yeah, you know, why is she so animated now? Because like this resonates with her. This gets her excited, right? She, Amy Wax has a lot of the shock jock in her. I, I mean, mean if I would. If you're born I here, would, you have but... absolutely a right. <laughs> like compare her demeanor now, all right, to more than five minutes ago. All right, the first 30, 30 minutes of the of the interview, she was just stuck in monotone, right? Just just reciting things she said a thousand times. Now she gets to say incendiary things that uh, she hasn't said very much in public, and she's just coming alive. I have to say, she's you know, glowing. I think most Americans have complicated feelings about immigration. I'm speaking for myself, but like you, my best friend's an immigrant who I godfather my first child. I mean, I really love. There are a lot of impressive immigrants, much more impressive than I am, and I think everyone's for that. But part of the deal is, you know, you don't show up in someone else's country and like start attacking them, right? I mean, that's just bad manners. Why can't you say that? Hey, hey, I, I converted to Judaism and uh, yeah, very quickly started going on the offense. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a very valid point. And I'm not I'm not talking about all immigrants. No, I, I get it. No, I think I, I think what I'm amazed at is, you know, how some of the people it, it kind of reminds me of Dennis Prager, a big fan, fan of Dennis Prager. And he experiences, you know, his absolute betrayal when I started writing some critical things about him on a, on a blog. So we, we we tend to expect that, you know, someone's done us a kindness or if someone's, you know, expressed gratitude for us, that they should just be permanently in some sort of subservient, grateful position. It's not really how a lot of people work, right? I can express my gratitude for you, you know, one day, and uh, three months down the line, I might have some strong criticisms. People in the leadership class behave, and how they get away with it, and how no one well, really calls it, them Well, that's, that's what it is. And it does feel like, yeah, because, I mean, I know, uh, yeah, I know an awful lot of the kind of people you're talking about and like all the ones I know like love America, you know, more than many Americans do, including my best friend. And uh, the chat says Amy Wax is much better on the Glenn Lowry show. Tucker requires her to figure out the arena. Yeah, Tucker's doing a lousy interview here. Friend is like the most patriotic person I've ever met. But, but they uh, need to speak out. I think, I I think, think uh, right. I'm disappointed at the way a number, the way that immigrants from Asia, from, from India, from places like that, you know. She's saying they need to speak out. Well, if you're gonna speak out, don't take Amy Wax here as, as a guide for how to speak out, because Amy Wax is doing herself and her side uh, no favors. Right? You wanna speak out, learn to speak in ways that the largest possible number of people can hear what you're saying and, and not lose their minds. And second, provide evidence when you're saying things that are very hard to hear, right? Come at it from an empirical perspective. You know, from, from non-Western countries are reluctant to get up there and say, uh, look, these trends, the way in which this anti-racism wokeness is going, we, we take issue with that. We reject that. I hear very, very little of that. No, that's right. Um, and one of the issues I talked to Lowry about is, you know, why do Asians vote so overwhelmingly Democratic? Why would they vote Republican, generally speaking? They're a minority group. You would expect the coalition of the fringe, right? You would not expect them to join with the white Christian core. You would expect them to be part of the fringe. Like, minority groups generally vote for the coalition of the fringe, as you would expect. Uh, how is that in their interest? I mean, the Democrats are the party of 
of wokeness. They are the party of America is a pervasively well, racist. You can say a lot about Asians, but you can't say that they're not voting their interests, right? Blacks are obviously voting their interests. Latinos are obviously voting their interests. And, and, and Asians who don't want a dominantly white country are probably voting their interests, right? So uh, Asians are not afraid to speak up for themselves when, say, school boards g go crazy and uh, water down the quality of, of education. So Asians are, are speaking up for themselves uh, quite often. They're, they're, yeah, and any time you shut down a school, a public school, those rare public schools that use colorblind admissions standards, you know, change Stuyvesant, Stuyvesant, Hunter College High School, Thomas Jefferson. Yeah, and I haven't noticed Asians just bending over and taking it, right? They speak up in their own interest and good for them. Jefferson in Fairfax County, Virginia, these are like the best schools in the country, and they're overwhelmingly Asian because... 40 teams a bit exercise. Well, I have to position myself, All right? If I'm going to put this on YouTube, you know, I'm in great danger of getting a strike. I have all the incentives to try to come up with criticisms against Amy Wax. I have no criticism. I have no incentives to, to praise Amy Wax. I have to live in society, bro. I have to exist on, on YouTube. I am positioning myself as an Amy Wax critic so I don't get a strike. And you think I'm exercised? You just should have seen me yesterday. I walked over nine miles and then I got on my bike and I biked over nine miles. So yeah, I'm pretty exercised. I I'm pretty fit, bro. It's only about aptitude. Right. So if you change those standards, who are you screwing? You know, you're screwing the, the Korean kid who's, whose dad literally owns a liquor store and showed up just to achieve, like you're hurting him. I, I, I agree completely. Yeah, there's very little, uh, there, there are groups and there are people in the Asian community who are saying. And that's why you see so many homeless Asians because of affirmative action. They've just, you know, found no way to make it in America because of these horrible university policies. No, they, they seem to have done pretty well, right? They're, they they high achieving, they earn more than white people, they have more solid family life, they have more wealth, they're, they're doing pretty good. Ending up, a guy named George Lee just uh, is the principal in one such group in New York that is uh, opposing changes in exam school admission requirements, which, you know, will obviously... Uh, Luke, are you optimistic for America's future for the majority of Americans have claims of American decline being greatly exaggerated compared to other countries, compared to other competing great powers? Yes, I, I believe that America is in great standing vis-a-vis -vis, everything's relative compared to other great powers. Do I think the overall quality of life in America is going to improve in the years ahead? No, I don't. I don't think the overall quality of life is going to improve in America. We're an incredibly... Uh, divided country, we have you know, diminishing social trust and, and social capital. So yeah, I think that my experience of, of two months in Australia and the much higher quality of life in, in Australia was, was a profound experience. So no, I think average quality of life for the average American is uh, very likely to decline over the next 50 years. But America vis-a-vis -vis China and Russia and, and Japan and the other great powers, I think America will be even more powerful. America is in a far better position than the Chinese, the Russians, and the Japanese. Obviously hurt Asians, but very few people have, have joined them. Um, so that, I find that, you know, very frustrating because uh, I don't like all this dumping on America. I think it's misguided. I think it's wrong. I think it's inaccurate. I don't think we're a pervasively racist society. That's a kind of make-believe uh, that's there to excuse a lot of self-inflicted wounds, uh, especially, I think, on the part of the black community. Uh, and I think it's very short-sighted for well, it's a dead Asians end. to go, yeah, to go along with that. That's, that's really what I'm saying. So what was... Uh... Uh, chat wants to know, why wouldn't general quality of life improve in America over the next 50 years? Because we have diminishing social capital and social trust. Very difficult to rebuild that. So all the trends point towards continued diminishment of social trust and social cohesion. When you are steadily losing social trust, social cohesion, and social capital, quality of life goes down. That's just how it is. Um, what was it like when you got back to campus 
after. So you had said a moment ago that it wasn't simply the idiot kids at the school. It wasn't just the 19-year-olds who were signing petitions. There were also faculty members. You oh, yeah. are a faculty member. So what was that like? Well, I mean, there was one faculty member who will go nameless who ginned up a petition to condemn me. He's no longer at the school. Uh, Glenn Medley says America's decline is uh, like YouTube. Yeah, remember how great YouTube used to be? And uh, Twitter was pretty cool, too. And half of my fellow faculty members signed it. Half did not. So did that's you know, good. know any of them personally? Oh, I know all of them. Because we're not that big a faculty. I know every single one of them. What's that like? Uh, well, a lot of the people that, that signed it, I think, are on some level coming back to shame, ashamed of it because they know that they shouldn't be condemning a fellow faculty member for... Telling the truth? You know, well, for even having an opinion. I mean, wholly apart from whether it's a ballot opinion or not, just having an opinion on some issue of broader import, that's, that's what faculty members do. It's just, it represents a failure of core academic values. And I think on some level they knew that. But the way that they dealt with me was pretty much by ignoring me, just kind of pretending I didn't exist. I mean, I had friends on the faculty who I socialized with who just ghosted me entirely. No. Oh, yes, of course, of course. And my dean, eventually, um, he told the associate dean, because I asked the associate dean, why am I not on any committees this year? And he said, because the dean doesn't want you on any committees, doesn't want you involved in this school at all. He doesn't want you to have any power. He doesn't want you to participate in any way. You're essentially, you know, dead man walking at this school. So what happens is the faculty of a dean do what they can within the rules, because I do have tenure. So that's like a big obstacle, or at least ostensibly it is, although if they really wanted to, they could probably get around it. They do everything they can to sort of attack me and undermine me, short of actually firing me, which would be a heavy lift. But they are working towards firing me, I think. It's just so, and I don't want to rub it in, or I mean, I'm sure this has got to be really painful for you, but I mean, that the, your peers, your colleagues would collaborate with this is just so shocking to me. It's kind of childish. Um, but it's been enlightening for me. And you said, well, Lowry learned from some of the bad things that have happened to him. But I, I'm not saying it's not painful at times. And, you know, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. But it has been enlightening and educational for me because it has uh, made me realize why so few people with tenure protection speak out. I mean, you but know. They have an it, right. Ostracism is really painful. I should know. I've been ostracized many times throughout my life when I started uh, writing my my unauthorized blog about Dennis Prager's radio show in late 1997, I lost every friend I had in Los Angeles, essentially, because every friend I had, I had in common with Dennis Prager. Every one of them sided with Dennis Prager that, you know, committing a terrible betrayal of Dennis Prager. So, yeah, if you want to say incendiary things, if you want to say things you're not supposed to say, uh, this is the life Amy Wax chose, right? She didn't have to use the language she, she used. Right. She didn't have to say things the way that she said them. She could have presented these things differently. Right? She chose this. Obligation to tell the truth. That's the whole point of tenure. They do, <laughs> to but make it easier for you to tell the truth. But they don't do it uh. because because of you know because social ostracism is a powerful thing, and it it can be a hurtful thing. Now, I happen to be pretty thick skin. Apparently. Yeah. I mean, I definitely am. Uh, compared to other people, and certainly compared to women, because women, you know, I'm generalizing here. Well, she's not thick-skinned enough to come on my show, right? We've exchanged several emails, and she was tempted. She she liked the, the interview I did with Greg Cochran, but she's not thick-skinned enough to, to come here and get a, get a real interview, not this namby-pamby Tucker Carlson crap. Here, but I think they're more interested in being approved of and being considered nice, right? And I am certainly not considered nice. That's the first thing that goes. But I am maybe more sympathetic marginally to people who, despite their ostensible job protection through tenure, nevertheless don't take full advantage 
of that job protection because there are all sorts of it would be insane for most faculty members even with tenure to behave as amy wax does it'd be insane for anyone for almost anyone for 99.9 percent .9 of people to to conduct themselves in a way that is just going to provoke incendiary hatred by the people who are most important to you by by your peers right is inc you know it's incredibly self-destructive for the overwhelming majority of people you should not you know essentially go out of your way to infuriate your peers and and much of what she's done is unnecessary all right she's committed you know unnecessarily incendiary evidence-free assertions that have led to this social ostracism right this is the life she chose i've got the life i chose you got the life you chose she got the life she chose. There have been formal ways in which, you know, you will feel the effects. Um, but the what about students your also ostracize you. I mean, the students won't take your classes. They, uh, you know, they shun you. They get on social media and say all sorts of things about you. Although I will say that, you know, there's a core of really wonderful students who uh, are take my classes, defend me. Uh, the Federalist Society, the people in the Federalist Society, there are some really courageous students. Who would have guessed that, that becoming a firebrand, becoming a, a person of intense polemics, becoming you know a brave soldier to save Western civilization, who would have guessed that that might come with a price? Like, people want to save Western civilization, but they don't want to be inconvenienced. You know, people want to save America, but they don't want to pay a price. Like people want to do the courageous thing, but without any downside. That, that's not how the world works. You want to step up and save Western civilization. This is a very tiny price to pay. Who I think appreciate my presence. So that's the other reason I stick around is that um, there is a relatively small number of students who really need someone like me on the faculty because of. And uh, Jeff says, uh, Josh says, I want to hear pre-censorship, pre-canceled cultures, Luke take, Luke's take on this. Well, if I was doing this show six years ago, it, this would be just ho-hum. I mean, I probably wouldn't even play it because it's not saying anything groundbreaking or terribly interesting. Right? This is edgy now. It's like, it's like uh, you, haven't looked at, uh, you haven't looked at the Sports Illustrated bathing suit issue and then finally you give in and, and you look at it. All right, let's say you're a sex and love addict and you've abstained from looking at the Sports Illustrated bathing suit issue and presuming if there aren't a lot of, you know, fat, ugly women in, in the latest one, you know, you finally give in and you, there's a good, raunchy Sports Illustrated bathing suit issue, you know, you'll get an intense rush, all right? You know, where you used to be watching, you know, Bukaki gangbangs, that's what it took, but you've, you've uh, sensitized yourself you know, you've been on the straight and narrow and, uh, and, and now you're, you're just relapsing to like Sports Illustrated level. All right. So you now I'm relapsing to a Sports Illustrated bathing suit issue level of uh, race realism. Well, six years ago, this would not have even given me a chubby. If I weren't there, there would be no one. Is and they true? tell me that. No, they they tell me one. that. They say, you know, there we are. We can't talk to anybody on the faculty. We're afraid of all of them because we know that they're all politically correct, even though they say that they're open-minded, they don't really mean it. Uh, we're, we fear that we will be called out by them, so we keep our heads down. So I think it's really important for someone to be there that they can talk to and, and they can speak their mind to. I mean, I teach a course in conservative political and legal thought, and I get a, tr a terrific group, and we have some ground rules in that class. You know, basically what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Uh, nothing that anybody says in this class is to be repeated if it would even remotely uh, get them into trouble with their fellow students and the like. Um, so you have an island of people. free expression. We have an island of, of free expression. Um, and, you know, you, you can't accuse other students of racism and sexism and all of this. I mean, you can tell them that they're wrong and tell them why they're wrong, but name calling is not allowed. Uh, just some basic rules, Tucker. That's all it really takes. I mean, if every professor... In she doesn't get to have this discussion because of these great, amazing rules, right? Some basic rules. That's, no, that's not what it takes. 
she has got a self-selected group. She's she's teaching a class in conservative legal thought, right? She's already self-selected. It's not these amazing rules that she's come up with that have uh, produced this intellectual utopia. Oppose those rules. The act. The act. That's nonsense. If if every you know other academic imposed their rules, that you know we'd have a complete turnaround. No, not really. Academy would be, I think, a much freer place. But right now, it's really a place of fear and intimidation. That's so. I've counted four that you've mentioned: schools or courses of study that you went through: Yale undergrad, Harvard Med School, Harvard uh, Law School, and then Cambridge, uh, Oxford. I knew it was one. Oh, I'm getting old. Anyway, you obviously are as deeply immersed in this world as anyone could be. Are you disappointed in what it's become? You must be disappointed. Totally, oh, come on. totally what uh, devastated questions. by what it's become. And I'm not the only on, person man. in my family who's involved in academia. Um, you don't think that I could give you a song and dance about how you know disappointing America is or universities are or you know, I could find disappointing things in Jews and Judaism and, and women and dating and relationships. Like It's so easy to be like, oh, I'm so disappointed in life. The, the world has failed me. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't want to blow the cover on, on my no, family you, members. No, you should not. Uh, but uh, there, there is some real egregious stuff going on not just in the law school, but in the sciences, in medicine. I know. Oh, I know. no, you cannot imagine how bad it is in medical schools and in science departments. And in medical schools, people's lives are on oh, the line. Oh, it's going to affect okay? health, health outcomes. How yeah. could it not? No, I will say no more, but it's it's worse, oddly enough, in, in medicine. Than in the humanities? Than, well, than in law. Because in law, you know, our stock and trade is argument is discourse, of course. you know, is, I mean, there, and certainly our philosophers, we have a contingent of philosophers and. Uh, law is a conservative profession, all right? All, all professions are primarily dedicated to defrauding outsiders and building their own power, prestige, and income. Same for law, same for dentistry, same for medicine, same for accountants. And I, they, they're the ones, I think, who resist it the most. They don't ultimately succeed in resisting this uh, orthodoxy that's been this pall of orthodoxy in the law school, but they, there may be the best holdouts from it because if they can't argue different sides right. of a question, like what's left for them to do, right? You um, eliminate the dialogue, there's no philosophy. Uh, exactly, there's yes. no philosophy. But in medicine, the people who are in uh, medical academia are not trained in that way, they're not I mean, they should be because they should be scientists as well as physicians. But <laughs> would think. somehow that didn't that didn't take. Um, they have been so uh, vulnerable to and amenable to this diversity and equity orthodoxy, and it is now part of medical training. It is part of uh, the process of getting into medical school. You know, you have to put out a statement, include all the reasons and the ways in which you advance the goals of diversity and equity to be hired we're in a medical kill, we're school. We're going to kill people with this. You know, you have to pay fealty and homage to diversity and equity. Uh, I mean... Okay, Amy, if you, if you want a good time, if you want a, a real interview, all right, come to the 40 show. We'll open up 40 University. We'll do something special. Okay, guys. Selma is tired of being just a symbol. They want change. Selma is tired of being just a symbol. They want change. Politicians flock to Selma to use the Edmund Pettus Bridge as a stage for their agendas. Meanwhile, the city is one of the poorest in the country. News by Emmanuel Felton. Selma, Alabama, with the blistering Alabama sun beaming down on them, the crowd at the foot of the Edmund Pettus Bridge was growing restless. The mass of marchers, which stretched a full city block, audibly groaned when it was announced that not only would Vice President Harris speak, but so would the five cabinet members and many of the national civil rights leaders present. As the speeches continued, a cry would occasionally ring out from the crowd, echoing the calls made by marchers 57 years before as they tried to cross the same bridge, let us march. Don't these guys have jobs? Like, don't they have, like, volunteering to do? Don't they have families to look after? Don't they have like adult responsibilities? 
Somehow, when I hear that Selma is tired of being just a symbol they want change, somehow I don't think they want to work. I don't think they want to do serious education. I don't think they want to lift themselves up. Instead, we're going to get a guilt trip about how the city is one of the poorest in the country. That's our fault. Like, they're raping each other. They're stealing from each other. They're blaring loud music. They're destroying their own quality of life. They're murdering each other. But I'm just going to bet somehow it's our fault. On March 7, 1965, more than 500 demonstrators gathered at Brown's Chapel in Selma to protest poll taxes, literacy tests, and other policies designed to keep black people from voting. They marched six blocks. Yeah, and as soon as they got rid of the, those policies, did uh, prosperity reign? Did freedom and justice reign? Did quality of life reign? Did social capital and social trust and social cohesion, did, did that all boom when they got rid of those awful policies? No, their problems were never because of those policies in the first place. Their problems are not outside of them. Their problems are inside of them. My problems are inside of me. Like, why do I have a horrible reputation with many women? Because I've acted like a pig to many women. Why do I have a horrible reputation with many men? Because I've acted like a pig to many men. Right? My problems are my problems. Selma's problems are overwhelmingly Selma's problems, not caused by outside forces. Ox to Broad Street, Selma's main thoroughfare, and then tried to cross the Pettus Bridge, where they were met by state troopers who attacked them with bully clubs and tear gas when they refused to turn back. Dozens were injured, and at least 17 were hospitalized. The brutal scene was broadcast around the world, and overnight the protesters and the city of Selma became worldwide symbols of the fight for equality. Two weeks later, Martin Luther King Jr., joined by more than 3,000 protesters. Like a fight for equality is the same as a fight against gravity, right? You can have the most courageous, you know, inspiring people lead a fight against gravity, but gravity is still going to be there, right? You can have the most inspiring people leading a fight for equality, but inequality is woven into the human condition. Right. So this notion that you just get the right spokespeople or you mount some kind of worldwide awareness that now you're going to you're going to overturn the rules of gravity. You're going to overturn the rules of inequality, which are just written into how people operate. Ain't going to happen. And you will waste your resources and your skills and your talents from doing things that could make a real difference in your life and in your community's life. Marched across the same bridge and kept marching 49 miles to the state capitol in Montgomery, a demonstration that successfully pressured Congress and President Johnson to pass the Voting Rights Act. In the nearly 60 years since those events... Yeah, the Voting Rights Act, didn't that just transform Selma? did that just transform the quality of life in black communities? Oh, wait, murder rates skyrocketed after the Voting Rights Act. Uh, quality of life in black communities fell after the Voting Rights Act. Uh, black families fell apart after the Voting Rights Act. Quality of life, generally speaking, for most blacks, declined after the Voting Rights Act. Selma has become an annual stopover for politicians looking to bolster their civil rights bona fides. Each March, to mark the anniversary of what became known as Bloody Sunday, the city hosts the Selma Bridge Crossing Jubilee. VIPs descend on the city to walk across the bridge arm in arm and commemorate the sacrifice. This is this is so shocking. You can get VIPs to your bridge in your town, and you can be a worldwide symbol for resisting gravity, right, and resisting inequality. And somehow that doesn't transform the quality of your life. Just imagine taking time off from work, taking time off from family, taking time off from getting a real education, you know, taking time off from you know, genuine volunteering that actually helps people somehow not doing the things that could uplift your life and instead engaging in a masturbatory effort to undo the laws of gravity and inequality that are just written in, into the universe. And, and uh, that kind of masturbatory exercise doesn't uh, make things super swell. Who would have thought, man, I was so super pumped. I thought that that Selma was just going to show us the way to reverse the rules of uh, gravity and the rules of inequality that have ruled the human condition for, for millennia. Wow, I was so super pumped. And it turns out they, they can't get rid of gravity. Like, who would have thought that? Like, who would have thought that they couldn't overturn how the, the world works? Okay, speaking of really uninspiring... Washington Post journalism. 
Let's have a look at this. Oh, we got another listen to. For unsettling takeaways from the French elections first round results. Wow, I bet you're really unsettled about the, the French elections. I mean, I don't know about you, but I couldn't sleep last night. I was just so unsettled about the, the French election results. Just deeply, deeply upsetting. Well, unsettling to whom? Right? I hate these news articles. It's always about, oh, so disturbing, or this is so amazing, or this is you know, so bad, and this is so good. To whom? Right? The same event will be unsettling to some people, inspiring to other people. Most people who watch my show are pretty okay with what happened in the French elections. Right? Some people are going to be unsettled. Some people are going to be stoked. Some people are going to be unsettled that, that uh, Elon Musk bought you know, 12% of Twitter. Other people are going to be stoked about it. But the news media acts as though it's just their emotional reaction, right? The universal mainstream media emotional reaction to event is the one that dominates from the Washington Post to the LA Times to CNN to ABC. And it's just taken for granted that this is the only emotional reaction that all decent people have, right? This is just, this is much a fact of life as gravity from, from a Washington Post mainstream journalism perspective that. Like, oh, it's just, you know, just taken for granted that uh, the French election's is unsettling. This, this, is a, this is crazy, right? It's just four unsettling takeaways. Some people are going to be unsettled, right? People who don't like the status quo are going to be thrilled. And the people who are unsettled are people who love the status quo. Opinion by James McCauley. The results of the first round of the French presidential election are anything but comforting. They sh to whom? Plenty of people received a lot of comfort, but he's talking as though it's just an objective truth that if Marine Le Pen gets a certain percentage of the vote over 20%, that that's just inherently uncomforting. Like, how gay is this? Like, this is like dripping with AIDS that if an election does not go the way that uh, the Washington Post thinks it should go, that it's just objectively, emotionally discomforting and unsettling. Show an incumbent president, Emmanuel Macron, who performed better than initially expected, but nowhere near as well as he should have. Most of all, they show a far right at the gates of power, with a real chance of winning the final round in two weeks. Until now, Macron has essentially declined to campaign, styling himself as a wartime president negotiating the bloody conflict between Russia and Ukraine. But French voters are skeptical, and the next two weeks may not be enough time for Macron to fend off far-right candidate Marine Le Pen. Here are the key storylines of Sunday's results. 1. The election is now Macron's to lose. Oh, the French wow. president, whose lead in the polls rapidly diminished in the lead-up to the first round of the vote. What a startling insight. This is why I subscribed to the Washington Post. Who would have thought that the, the guy in power and the guy with the most votes... It's his election to lose. Never would have guessed that. Vote fared slightly better than anticipated. He came in at about 28%, roughly five points ahead of Le Pen's 23%. Though the far left Jean-Luc Mélenchon nearly topped Le Pen. The okay, look, there's a reason you watch this show, and it's for high-quality, peer-reviewed academic discourse. It's not for you know, this, this sexy Washington Post analysis of French elections. So let's go back to this terrific book by Professor Stephen Turner, Liberal Democracy 3.0, Civil Society in an Age of Experts. All right? So the political world that we have in the West is largely a result of 17th century European religious wars. Right? That's what gave rise to modern liberal democracy. How do we neutralize religion so that people, Europeans in particular, stop slaughtering each other over religion. So we developed a neutralization of the religious sphere, right? It was to become a matter of, of private conscience. The government wouldn't legislate uh, what would be the, the uh, form of religious expression that was socially acceptable. And so you don't like the government we have today. You don't like the political structure that we have today in the United States, Canada, England, Australia, New Zealand, France, Germany, Scandinavian countries. These forms of, of democratic government all come as a reaction to the 17th century European wars. And so we're increasingly neutralizing more and more of life. So we, we have tried to remove religion from, from being the center of political 
fighting and and now with COVID, like we've offshored COVID to the experts. All right, we're going to govern with science. So we've tried to remove COVID from the political. And if there's you know some other problem, a nuclear nuclear plant explodes, then we'll have a commission. Right, we'll remove it from the political. Right, so objective solutions and facts. Right, they're arrived at procedures that produce the same results regardless of who's following the procedures. Now, unfortunately, you do this with different groups and you reliably get the same IQ results, but that's bad. So that's a bad form of objective truth. So the problem with objectivity generating procedures and objective facts is they are rarely sufficient to settle a question or to make a decision, like unless one has decided in advance to let the results settle the question. So scientific facts right? They're, they're just another category, like global warming, right? There are certain facts, but certain facts put together don't say that, you know, global warming is going to end life as we know it in 30 years. There are deductions from facts that, uh, that can possibly lead to that sort of conclusion. So neutral, objective, scientific facts usually are insufficient to be much of a constraint on political decisions, but the desire to move a topic out of the political, right? Global warming is not to be political anymore. It's got to be removed from the political, placed in the hands of experts, right? So we, we no longer really live in a democracy. We live in an administrative state, right? And so we want to move more and more topics out of the political religion, global warming, uh, education, right? We want to move these things out of political discussion into the hands of experts. So experts decide what you get to say on YouTube, right? The, the civil rights community Essentially, the Anti-Defamation League decides what we can say on YouTube and on social media, and the World Health Organization decides what we get to say on social media with regard to COVID, all right? We're placing more and more and more of our life in the hands of experts. So one of the central devices of liberal democracy to ensure that we don't slaughter each other over things like religion is to steadily shrink the realm of the political and expand the realm where experts rule, right? We delegate discussion and we keep removing issues from discussion and then give them to experts, right? We offshore discussion and give it to the experts. So in 19th century America, you had all these discussions of public health measures against cholera and they were transferred by acts of state legislatures from the hands of city councils and boards of health that they appointed to other boards and commissions. And in the 20th century, monetary decisions, right? Politicians don't get to decide monetary policy. It's been delegated to the experts at the Federal Reserve Bank. So there's relevant expert knowledge, and we just keep handing off more and more of our world to the experts to decide because we are not worthy of deciding these things on our own because we don't supposedly have the expertise. And this widespread throughout the first world desire to resolve problems by delegating them to experts does not generally match the capacity of these experts, right? We have doctors setting policy or, you know, medical experts setting policy, but they're not doing it by acting within the domain of their expertise. They're not just applying technical considerations in some kind of scientific or objective way directly to the question, right? Right. Instead, they have to use, you know, reasoning by analogy. Right. They, they they have to reason like a lawyer. Right. So expertise is usually anything but expertise in a particular area for which experts have been given the power to decide how things are going to operate. So few decades ago, scientists were asked when it would be safe for farmers to return sheep to particular fields that have been polluted by radioactivity. And so based on their empirical experience and understanding of the causal process in a particular kind of soil, they estimated that the radioactive effects would dissipate in three weeks. Well, they were wrong. The kinds of soil that the sheep were grazing on contained a great deal of clay. Clay retained the radioactivity much longer than the scientists had predicted. So this is how expertise usually works. People 
have genuine expertise in one area, but then they're asked to go outside of that. And so they reason, okay, I know in, in this particular soil, we have studies that uh, radioactivity leaves after three weeks. We're just going to apply it into completely different soil where it, it doesn't really apply. So uh, with regard to global warming, it, it's, uh, it's all supposed to be based on science, just like the prohibition movement was based on alcohol science. We have experts telling women we need to get, you know, more and more mammographies. All right. You need to get you know, this uh, radiological testing for, for your chest. Well, uh, early mammography studies make no effect on mortality rates for breast cancer. So climatologists, they select the variables in their models. Then they analogize and they simplify to the real world, which will certainly behave differently than the model just like lawyers simplify a complex situation to select those features which are you know, best suited for making a particular case. And then there's a further decision, a decision to accept this extension of reasoning by the expert, you know, accept their simplifications and their implications, and then to act politically on them. Now, the reasoning of these experts in these special domains, whether monetary policy or COVID policy or global warming may be better than that of non-experts. But it, it may be worse. And what you're doing is you're making more and more life outside the realm of politics, outside of democracy. Regular people have less and less say about the way government works. Right? We have more and more of delegating powers to bodies that claim to represent you know, some, some group, so the American Medical Association, the American Bar Association. So in, in ancient Rome, the institution, the dictator was a legal form, which an individual was delegated dictatorial powers for a limited period, period to deal with a particular crisis. But the way the delegation of powers is increasingly working in democracies is that uh, we're giving powers to, to these groups. Like the, the American Bar Association has a tremendous impact on how our legal system is operated. So we're delegating this power that rightly belongs to the people to a particular commission, a private commission. So much of what governs our daily life is the product of commissions of various kind, the labels on the food we eat, the standards for the air we breathe, standards for the water we drink. This is usually the product of collective decision-making by commissions bodies outside of politics and their standards and their practices are contested inside their group, but not open to, to our vote or even to our lawsuit. Right? Consider the children's playground. The, the standards for children's playgrounds in the United States was produced by a knowledge movement subsidized by the Russell Sage Foundation during the first part of the 20th century. So the standards it's defined were made an issue in social surveys promoted by reform groups usually playground associations in each city, then taken up by civic betterment associations, and then accepted by cities as normal. So this led to a uniformity of product and of experience in the daily life of children. And so this whole movement was a large part of commission from below. No government agency authorized it as political success depended on the endorsement of local leaders and community activists who pressured cities to live up to their standards. Now, we have another change in playgrounds in response to threats of legal liability. And in Beverly Hills, it's so shocking that they've ripped out public basketball courts because Beverly Hills doesn't like basketball Americans. I don't know why Beverly Hills has such a hard time with basketball Americans, where they try to do everything they can to repel basketball Americans. They don't even want a, you know, a subway going through Beverly Hills in case it brings basketball Americans. So Alexis de Tocqueville, when he visited America 200 years ago, he saw how there were all sorts of associations, but they're not the associations that we're talking about here, right? These, these were not associations of knowledge, right? Now to be an effective political association has become necessary to become a knowledge association, to become expertized, right? To, to have an association, you have to claim special knowledge, Think about the Bar Association. Is this a private voluntary organization or effectively an arm of the judicial system? 
powers delegated to the Bar Association, including disciplinary powers over legal practice, the ability to represent clients before courts. These are state powers, but the Bar Association is not a state entity. It's a private entity that's been delegated these powers. So associations like the Bar Association, the American Medical Association, etc., their power and prestige and ability to make money depends upon their successfully staking knowledge claims that they know better than you. Right? They concentrate opinion. They resolve disagreements internally. And then they try to come out with, with, a, with a presentation that they know better than you. And that's where their status and prestige and power comes from. So Leo getting at Leo Szilard, right? An important figure in the history of the atomic bomb. He writes in the early 1960s, a biographer that uh, Szilard's plight as a freelance thinker and policy proponent was poignantly described by his biographer. So Leo had begun to realize his limits as a humorist and outsider in Washington in early 1960s. Washington, D.C. is a serious and self-important city that squanders laughter and lives by cliches. So I'm an Alexander Technique teacher. Alexander technique it doesn't have a ton of prestige i remember who's that fat woman who's always getting naked and making making tv shows about uh women in their early 20s and uh i remember one of those shows a guy introduces himself as an alexander technique teacher and she says oh that's the gayest thing i've ever heard so being an alexander technique teacher it doesn't come with like legal privileges uh, like a, a doctor or a dentist so we don't even have the, the privileges of, of chiropractors, which is just a complete scam. So America is incredibly credentialed oriented, but uh, having a credential as an Alexander Technique teacher, you know, that and $5 will get you a small coffee at Starbucks. So Leo Szilard was a professor of biophysics from the University of Chicago. He was not a consultant to the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. He was not a member of the President's Science Advisory Committee. He was not a fellow at a local think tank, he was not a consultant to a congressional committee. So as he discovered during his first months in the capital, Washington is a city where what you do is often less important than where you do it. So you can be doing incredibly important things, but if you're not doing it in important places, then you don't have much prestige. Okay, so claims about global warming. Right, they're subjected to peer review, but that does not make them facts like those of core science, because the reviewers and the review process are not the same as for, for genuine facts. Peer review is a procedure of evaluation. It's only as good as the peers who are reviewing. It's a decision-making device. It's a usually low threshold on what is to be included in the literature for the purposes of scientific communication. So the power of expert bodies relies in large part on producing consensus. So, and then you get to regulate and you get to standardize and you get to create certifying bodies that endorse particular practices, training regimes, and standards. Now, the scientific basis for these practices is sometimes real and substantial, but it's frequently far removed from anything real and substantial. The basis of the practice is usually some combination of the scientific with the non-scientific often with elements that are objective and then things that are just a mishmash of assumptions, common sense, statistical results, and what will simply make you look good and enable you to extract the, the maximum of power and prestige, which is what all professions are out. They want to extract the maximum of income and power and prestige for their members by screwing over the general public to the extent that they can get away with it. Uh, Carl Schmidt talks about judicial discretion, right? L many, many legal questions cannot be decided on legal grounds. They require a non-legal consensus by judges. Yeah, and in playgrounds today in America, the burden of standards has shifted to the court. So old style playgrounds still exist following old standards, but for new equipment and new types of equipment, the threat of litigation over injuries is the dominant fact. The result that even simple pieces of manufactured playground equipment come with complex lawyer written warnings. But this is another form of the delegation of expert questions to other bodies, in this case, the courts, which then must hear expert witnesses about the risks of given designs based on supposedly objective measures of injury and 
on research about the product. So there are essentially three eras of liberalism. So li liberalism 1.0 was uh, really client clientism. It was after the English Civil War and the German Civil War. So Carl Schmitt believed that the removal of religion from politics was an essential condition for the birth of liberalism in the form of rational public opinion. So you got the moralization of politics, the condemnation of one's opponents as sinners or as tools of the devil. This is the end of rational discussion and the beginning of religious warfare. So this was the experience of Europe in the 17th century. Religious warfare, the suppression of religious opinion and its expression, was the basic fact of the European experience prior to the 17th century. Now, according to the traditional liberal account, the, we took the business of religion away from the state, separated religion from politics, and then created a safe space for civility. Now, the advantage of this traditional account is that it makes sense of the dramatic and traumatic political history of Europe during the 17th century and the phenomena of war, civil war, and the diasporas of Huguenots and others the rise of religious solidarity across national boundaries and the terms of the eventual end of religious warfare. Now, Thomas Hobbes, I've been reading Leviathan, which I think came out in 1651. He claimed that uh, the state should regulate all thought. Now, Europe has obviously gone in a very different uh, direction. So clientelism is the name of the system of relations between patrons and their clients is taken from the explicit legal form in the Roman Republic, but we still use this kind of language today when we sign a letter, you know, your humble servant. So clientelism is a pre-political surrogate for politics. It's the default form of the organization of, of peoples and groups. So in the Pacific Islands and in Africa, you'd call this big man complex, where members of society are dependent upon you know one big man protector and you also see this in in ghettos a more refined version of clientelism occurs in settled hispanic societies in the form of debt relations you've got the local landowner is the person to whom one can turn to to borrow money you have a personal relationship with him if you use yeah you use phrases in your letters such as your humble and obedient service servant this is used by persons who are not literally servants but is a characteristic frequent and a relic of a relation of clientelism in which a person without such a relationship to appeal to would have found survival difficult. So then liberalism 2.0, democracy 2.0 was based on rational discussion that we could, we could reason together. We could talk things out. So here is perhaps the, the best embodiment of uh, liberal democracy 2.0 and it comes from a passage in john stuart mill's autobiography where he talks about his father how his father in politics had an unbounded confidence in the efficacy of two things representative government complete freedom of discussion so complete was my father's reliance on the influence of reason over the minds of man whether whenever it is allowed to reach them that he felt as if all would be gained if the whole population were taught to read, if all sorts of opinions were allowed to be addressed to them by word and in writing, and if by means of the vote they could nominate a legislature to give effect to the opinions they adopted. He thought that when the legislature no longer represented a class interest, it would aim at the general interest, honestly and with adequate wisdom, since the people would be sufficiently under the guidance of educated intelligence to make in general a good choice of persons to represent them, having done so to leave to those whom they had chosen a liberal discretion. So aristocratic rule, the government of the few, being in his eyes the only thing that stood between mankind and an administration of their affairs by the best wisdom to be found among them. So the aristocratic rule was the object of his sternest disapprobation and democratic suffrage, the principal article of his political creed, not on the grounds of liberty, the rights of man, right, but on securities for good government. He held fast to the essentials. He was indifferent to monarchical and republican forms. Let me get a little bit more Amy Wax here. It's, it's everywhere. And there are these commissars. You know, the Department of Medicine has 
a diversity and equity officer who sits in on hiring, uh, hiring meetings, uh, sits in on departmental meetings, um, is everywhere monitoring what people say, monitoring the policies, shaping the policies. Uh, th that is happening in medical schools. Make no mistake about it. Every one uh, of which takes federal money. Oh, well, I mean, part of the reason they're doing all of this is that, you know, they, they are feeding at the trough of the federal treasury big time. And as, as a condition of getting these grants, which are their life. So socialism is inherently elitist. Socialism and, and communism and left-wing thought says that we're better off when experts run things as opposed to when the people run things. So the socialist idea is inherently anti-populist. It is hostile to the notion that untutored legislative preferences, opinions held by ordinary people of what law should be enacted, that this ought to be paramount. So socialism is implicitly hostile to the idea that government by discussion ought to be the center of constitutional order. So the collectivist current and socialist doctrine emphasize instead the superior wisdom of the state and the consequent necessity of intrusions into the freedoms of individuals. And so that brings us to liberal democracy 3.0, which is the ever-increasing rule of experts. And that's the world we live in now. As each year goes by, more and more of our life is run by experts who are beyond the political. We have a steady withering away of civil society. We have less and less concern with government by discussion. So uh, the author of this terrific book, Liberal Democracy 3.0, Civil Society in an Age of Experts, Professor Stephen Turner, he has wonderful examples of his ideas. And he talks about arriving in Sweden during a campaign. I asked a Swedish friend what the election was about. He found this banal question to be sufficiently intriguing to write a newspaper story on it. Why? Because not only was there no great issue in the election, the phenomenon of elections based on large issues was un-Swedish and the question misguided. The reason for this are many, and they include a particular tradition of compromised politics. But some of them point beyond Sweden. Like Germany and much of the rest of Europe, there was no protracted period in like that in Britain in the mid-19th century, during which a liberal bourgeoisie ruled through discussion. So liberal democracy 2.0 was ruled through discussion. So that was a phase that was partly a matter of form, a superficial phenomenon that barely touched the continued power of state bureaucracies. So in Sweden, everything in Sweden that is not nailed down is a subject for a royal commission. And more and more of life in Australia and in England is a subject for a royal commission. After 9-11, you got the 9-11 Commission. After the Kennedy assassination, you got the, you know, the Warren Commission. So in Sweden and in most of Europe, commissions of every conceivable public body and interest associations are consulted. When anything goes wrong, after a glare of angry publicity, all the experts in the country are mobilized overnight and they are organized as a commission to inquire into something. And that's just the, the most Swedish, the most German, the most European of all institutions, a commission to inquire into something. And what the commission decides is what becomes policy. So this is a form of politics that is a surrogate for government by discussion. This is really a surrogate for liberal democracy. Like publicity has its role in, in the acting, right? In, in the drama of legitimation. But the public does not get to decide in Europe, generally speaking. In all things Swedish, in pretty much all things German, in pretty much all things French, in pretty much all things uh, Norwegian, the expert rules. So in 1957, a plebiscite, that's a straight up and down vote, was held to inquire whether the Swedes wished to be like other Europeans and drive on the right-hand side of the road instead of the left. The vote went strongly against that. Ten years later, the change is made. Even so. So even though the people had overwhelmingly spoken against driving on the right-hand side of the road, that was the policy that Sweden made, right? Because pub the public 
having evidently made a fool of itself, is not consulted again. Then there was a public protest against uh, public art that was selected by a state art council in Sweden. And the council had the authority to force through its wishes in the choice and placing of works of art in public buildings owned by the state. Right? And they said, our choice of works of art takes a long-term view, cannot concern itself with the tastes and caprices of, of the public. Right? Th this is the pure voice of expert bureaucratic power, and this is, dominates all of the first world, and we don't yet see any alternative to the administrative state. Right? That's what we live in now, liberal democracy 3.0, the administrative state. Now, Clausewitz talked about war is politics by other means. So the American Civil War was an extension of legislative controversy by other means. And uh, many people you know, learned a sobering lesson that a politics of moralizing intolerance has a price in blood. We, we once again have a, a politics of moralizing intolerance. You know, will there be a substantial price in blood for our politics today? The English Civil War of the 17th century taught the same lesson. In the 19th century, in the first part of the 20th, the demands of empire made stakeholders of those who voted, and that both sobered and hardened them. So this political education was the tough core of liberal democracy in the English-speaking world. So in a 2001 lecture, Tomas Hendrik Ilves, the Estonian Minister of Foreign Affairs, observes that at the root of anxiety about the European community, the European Union, there is the feeling that fundamental decisions previously made in a transparent and legally understandable way at the level of the democratic post-Westphalian nation-state are being transferred to a higher body, the European Union. So a body where decision-making is not clear, not transparent, not understandable, not in accord with standards of parliamentary procedures, where the divisions of power are modeled, where the connection between the individual citizen's opinion and his opportunity to make his opinion clear through established means is no longer clear. So increasingly in Europe, the citizen senses Europe is replacing the government of persons with the administration of things. And it is this administration of things which dominates throughout the first world that causes unease among European citizens or first world citizens, right? There's this increasing fear that government of persons is less and less relevant. The democratic nation state developed in most of Europe after the Enlightenment, the French Resolution, has had as its core assumption that the citizen has his say in what happens in his country. It is the absence of this feeling that distinguishes undemocratic countries from democratic ones. It was the failure to allow the citizen his say that led ultimately to the fall of the Berlin Wall. Blood, without which they can't survive, they have to engage in all these equity and diversity related activities. Take a look sometime at what you need to say and do in order to get an NIH grant. A whole section of how your project is advancing the cause of diversity and equity and the participation of underrepresented minorities. And, you know, I'm sorry to say, Tucker, but one area in which underrepresented minorities are woefully lagging behind is in the sciences. It's not subtle. It's not a small gap here. It's an enormous gulf. And that is the gulf that they have to somehow paper over to get the required number of people uh, from these various groups into science and into medicine. So, uh, you know, you think law is bad, but you haven't really seen anything until you cross the street and, and look at the science departments. I mean, it, it, that, that feels unfixable to me. Oh, it's fixable. It is so easily fixable by a few key people just standing up and saying, you know, this, this is destructive. This is well, it's terrible. Ter it's terrifying. Uh, this, I mean, if it's this like... This shall not pass, but, you know... It's a, it's a collective action problem. And what's interesting is I'm on a number of email lists with people in the sciences, um, some of them more prominent than others, a lot of them kind of junior or semi-junior, uh, who 
will have none of this. They are alarmed by it. They hate it. They don't agree with it. They reject it. But most of them are not in the position to do anything about it. Because okay, Twitter grapples with an Elon Musk problem. So notice that this is the dominant theme in the news media that uh, what's the real story here is that employees at Twitter feel uncomfortable. What's most important with Twitter is that the employees feel good. Like the concerns of users of Twitter don't, don't really amount to a hill of beans for the, for the New York Times and for the other elite media talking about this Elon Musk story. And so... Twitter grapples with an Elon Musk problem. Mr. Musk, Twitter's biggest shareholder, is free to buy more stock in the company and could use the platform against itself. Some employees are dismayed. Oh, no, employees are dismayed. My God, that's what's most important, that employees are dismayed. What about millions of users are dismayed by the increasingly woke politics of, of Twitter, the increasing censorship of right-wing thought? No, that doesn't matter. What's important here is some employees are dismayed. Oh, no, that really makes me feel bad. I don't want Twitter employees to feel bad. So one bloke who's on Twitter's founding team says, Twitter has always suffered more than its fair share of dysfunction, but at least we weren't being actively trolled by prospective board members using the product we created. No, it's just for people who write of center. Now, we've been actively uh, shadow banned, banned, uh, you know, our, our voices have been taken away from us on Twitter, but that doesn't get a mention in this New York Times article. Uh, Patrick Gadsden, co-head of the shareholder activism practice at this law firm, said he felt sympathy for Twitter. What about sympathy for Twitter's users, right, who get this woke left-wing slant? Like, every time I go to Twitter and I open it up, it forces me to read, like, 50, no, like 10, 15 tweets. I have no interest in reading people I'm not subscribing to. It's force feeding me, you know, left wing or just other nonsense I have no interest in before I can get to read the people that I actively choose to follow. So Patrick says, you know, feel sympathy for Twitter. Oh, what about sympathy for its users? I would never want any director that I represent to have to deal with this situation. Oh, God forbid that they might feel uncomfortable. Right. Forget the distress of the users. It's uh, the, the directors. They're, they're the ones that we, we should really be feeling sorry for. Did you know that Mr. Musk has long shown significant disrespect for corporate governance rules? Oh, no. 2018, he faced securities fraud charges after inaccurately tweeting that he had secured funding to take Tesla private. He made a 420 joke. He made a 420 joke, and this is how the New York Times reports it. Inside Twitter on Monday, employees were dismayed and concerned by Mr. Musk's antics. Oh, no, those poor dears. Right? After the billionaire suggest over the weekend that Twitter convert its headquarters into a homeless shelter because no one shows up anyway, employees questioned how Mr. Musk would know, given that he hadn't visited the building in some time. Oh, right. The only way you can know about what's going on in a building is to actually visit it. You know, there's this thing called the cell phone. Right? There's this thing called Twitter. There's this thing called social media. There's this thing called the news where you can often find out about events that you don't have first-hand access to. I mean, how gay is this article? They also point out that Mr. Musk could easily afford to help San Francisco's homeless himself. Yeah, that's what it's all about when he's making this joke on Twitter. Others said they were upset. Look, this article is dominated by the feelings of these Awful, woke Twitter employees. Others say they were upset at Mr. Musk tweets criticizing the company's product and business model, noting he didn't appreciate the time and the thought that went into updating Twitter's services over the years, and he had no knowledge of the product roadmap. Some employees said they were relieved after reading that Mr. Musk would not join the board of, Twi of Twitter, the board of directors, right? I was reading an article in Breitbart the other day, Christian satire site, Babylon B, Turning Point USA founder Charlie Kirk and Fox News Tucker Carlson are all still locked out of their Twitter accounts for posting that transgender assistant secretary Rachel Levine is a biological male. Telling the truth on Twitter, right? From from a conservative perspective, these people are just telling the truth, right? Telling, telling the truth, you get banned about something 
you know, so mundane. I mean, everyone I know is, is thrilled with the prospect of uh, Elon Musk taking over Twitter. As the leadership is behind it 100%. So take Dorian Abbott. I'm not outing him because he's in he the was, public eye. He was sitting in the seat you're occupying right now. Oh, good. Yes. Okay, so he's... He's one of the people on these, you know, email lists and in these groups. These groups are starting to form. Uh, and, you know, he's been very outspoken, but he has suffered a penalty as a result. Oh, that's for sure. Yeah. So, you know, you look at him, if you're just, you know, Mr. Science working in your lab or even running a lab, um, you look at Dorian Abbott and you say, oh, do I really want to do this to myself? And it's not just you and your career, but it's your associates, it's your family, right? It's your friendships. It's, excuse me for being crude, you know, whether your wife will sleep with you. Uh, it's, you know, whether your friends oh will God. invite that's you over real, for dinner. That's a real thing. Uh, it's it, it, it's a real crude, thing. Please. Well, what I tell people is you will lose friends. But you know what? You'll make new friends. That's the interesting thing. Yes. People will come out of the woodwork. Very sophisticated, interesting, smart people. You know, what I call the smart deplorables. Uh, and they will yeah, reach I, out to you. When I started and, writing my unauthorized you know, website about Dennis Prager, yeah, I lost all my friends and I started making new ones. You know, and I got out of a you know, tiny insular community. And uh, there's a big, beautiful world out there. And I got to meet, you know, fantastic people like uh, the regulars in the chat. So by popular demand, I'm going to tackle the topic of post-tradition. This is uh, Stephen Turner once again. The tradition of post-tradition. So according to Google Ngram, which tracks, you know, how often words are used, the term post-traditional arrives at the turn of the 20th century, but it only begins to be widely used after 1960. So you can understand it's some kind of novel theoretical concept, which just applies to the last half of the 20th century. It tells us something about the meaning of our times. But post-tradition has a relationship to much deeper, older, and more pervasive sets of distinctions involving modernity and the larger trajectory of European society from the medieval period on the Enlightenment, democratization, capitalism, industrialization, urbanism, rationalization, differentiation. So it follows and it resembles a longer run discussion of the prospects for a new kind of society based on a new or revised spiritual order or new values. So this is getting to the deeper stuff behind all sorts of revolutionary movements, including the alt-right and ethno-nationalism. So the transition to modernity, you could, you could overstate and say this is the core problem for the modern social sciences like sociology, psychology. Right. The Enlightenment thinkers said tradition's a problem. Human beings are basically good. We need to get rid of those things that holds people down. Then Edmund Burke, great uh, founder of conservatism, he said that this notion that tradition's a problem, well, that's a problem. And the St. Simonians, they, they said we have to understand Enlightenment thinkers in their own historical context. They're, they're products of the decay of the previous organic epoch. So uh, Kevin McDonald kind of has this view that uh, Europe had an organic, meaning living, breathing, functional, cohesive society before you know Jews came along and, and wrecked things. So a good baseline for understanding all this literature about tradition, post-tradition, and modernity is the account given by Herbert Spencer, who was incredibly influential at the end of the 19th century, libertarian. Right. He was a resolute defender of the rise of the autonomous individual. He was an optimist about change. He rejected the idea that liberalism was just a passing thing. He believed that the decline of religion meant that mutual tolerance, the daily habit of insisting on self-claims while respecting the claims of others, which the system of contract involves, would be characteristic of a life carried on under voluntary cooperation rather than the traditional life carried on under compulsory cooperation. So Tradition referred to life under compulsion, 
modernity referred to voluntary cooperation as a basis for social organizing. Now, other thinkers thought the corrosive effects of Protestant individualism were the central factor in modernity, that this created political and moral individualism. Now, at the core of these critiques on both sides, you know, the moral regeneration critique and the new values side is nostalgia for the integrated and ordered societies of pre-modern Europe, which Kevin MacDonald is also nostalgic towards, the alt-right's nostalgic towards. So modernity was the destruction of the, the organic, integrated, ordered societies of pre-modern Europe in this perspective. So until World War I, from the Age of Enlightenment to World War I, there was this widespread intellectual trend believing that life was just getting better and better. Then we had World War I, things took a darker turn. So you had one bishop made a much publicized plea to completely suspend science until culture could catch up. And you had all these new ideas about women's roles, marriage, and sex. These discussions perhaps reached their peak in Bertrand Russell's Marriage and Morals. I mean, that guy wrote like 100 books. And then there was a response to Russell by Christians then there were parallel discussions in the United States about companionate marriage. Instead of marriage according to tradition, we're now going to form a, a model where people just voluntarily choose to be companions and personally develop themselves and each other. And marriage is going to be all about the individual satisfaction of both sexes. And religion no longer going to be about doing God's will. It's going to be about healing people, healing society. So in Britain in the 1930s, you had this rich mix of nostalgia for the orderly societies of the Middle Ages combined with a, a Christian socialism, which led to the moral rearmament movement, which launched in 1938 in response to the spiritual crises of the times and was explicitly conceived in response to Nazism. Now, the arrival of World War II focused the discussion on the moral crisis. And one theme was the question of just what World War II was being fought for. And so Robert Maynard Hutchins, the president of the University of Chicago, who got rid of their football team, and John Dewey debated the question in the pages of Fortune magazine. The famous London discussion group, The Moot, debated the possibility of reviving Anglicanism or creating a new social doctrine with the force of religion, the social gospel. And you also saw this type of discussion in T.S. Eliot with his tract Christianity and Culture. So the Moot's participants were concerned with the biggest of pictures, you know, how do the lessons of past societies and social change, how can that inform the creation of future societies? So they thought of the present as an unsatisfactory interregnum between coherent orders. So we're, they thought of the present as living in liminal space. You know, liminal space is an area that no one's ever been before. It's, it's a new, new land. Now, these intellectuals had great trouble coming to an agreement. And there's a famous book published called In the Year of Our Lord, 1943, where Alan Jacobs chose the idea of the war as a contest of values with Nazism. And this was widely accepted by all the intellectuals, but then the many intellectuals who contributed to this discussion, who, who were making the argument, yeah, World War II is all about a contest of values, but they could not agree on what those values were. And befriend you and invite you to their farm in Saratoga or whatever, you know, <laughs> no, it's totally uh, true. you will, they will come up to you at the gym and say, I read the article about you. Do you want to have dinner with me and my husband? I mean, there, there are such people. Um, Andy Gutman, the Brearley dad, I don't know if you've had him on, but you of should. Of course. Because he's fantastic. He is. He is like on message, Tucker. The guy is smarter than 99% of the academics What a wonderful I know. letter that was. That... I know, and he never, he knows what he thinks. He understands its implications. He never, he never sort of strays and deviates. He gets it. But anyway, he told me something interesting because he lives in, you know, among wealthy people in Manhattan. That's his milieu, the whole Brearley uh, shtick. Uh, and he said once this... Once he wrote this letter, which created a firestorm, he realized something he'd never seen before. 
there are all of these charming, smart Republicans out there. He never knew a single one. Yeah. Uh, so that expanded his world. Um, so if you can take the rejection and the isolation, uh, at least for a while, uh, it doesn't last forever. How is this is my last question. It's kind of personal, but I can't control myself. How essential is it to have the support of your family? And what's the it's uh, a lot easier when you have the support of your family, but uh, you can do it without the support of your family, all right? It, to, to be a mensch, like to be a fully realized human being, you have to be able to give yourself support. You can't be like relying on the support of, of other people, right? I want attention, right? So instead of like needing having to have that attention from you and you telling me, oh, what an amazing show this is, if to the extent that I've done a good show today, if I can recognize that, I can give myself the attention that, you know, previously just thirsting for from others. Right, so three most prominent thinkers associated with the concept of post-traditionalism. And you're listing off Alastair McIntyre, Robert Bella, and Anthony Giddens, right? They all came to it pretty much through Marxism. So according to McIntyre, the desire for new moral order was an alternative to the barren opposition of moral individualism and amoral Stalinism. So all three thinkers probably saw on one hand, you've got Stalinism, and on the other hand, you've got this uh, individualism. We need a third way. So liberalism, not an option, because Marxism revealed that liberalism is a deceiving and self-deceiving mask for certain social interests, which tends to dissolve traditional human ties and to impoverish social and cultural relationships. So the, the Declaration of Independence, right? All men are born with certain inalienable rights, including the right to become a woman, right? That kind of inalienable rights orientation tends to dissolve traditional human ties. Like you marry a bloke, he turns into a woman. Eh, not so easy for maintaining a marriage and family and standing in a community, right? If people can just keep, you know, realizing themselves as another sex or this or as that, right? Liberalism tends to dissolve traditional human ties. And Robert Bella also shared McIntyre's horror of moral individualism. So moral individualism means the individual decides what's moral and what's immoral. So Bella cited as an early motivation his ambivalence towards the Southern California culture in which I grew up and the chaotic society in which I lived. So Bella became famous for his leadership of the team that wrote the best-selling Habits of the Heart, which was a condemnation of American individualism. So Giddens believed that the tradition of social theory dominated by Karl Marx was no longer important. So he rejected communism, he rejected liberalism, he sought a third way. So traditional societies, and you see this in traditional societies today, they kind of suppress the self in a prison of duties, demands, restrictions, usually with religious justifications. Now, this hasn't been fully removed by modernity, but it has been watered down. Now, the concept of post-traditional appears to be a radical break with that. It, it implies not only a break with particular traditions, but with tradition itself. So post-traditionalism means the end of traditional social roles and burdens and the possibility of self-invention. You can become a member of the opposite sex. Maybe you can change your race, right? So modernity refers to modes of social life or organization which emerged in Europe from the 17th century on and which became worldwide in their influence. Modern social institutions are distinct from the traditional order. They've been rationalized. So we've got this sheer pace of change. We've got the global scope of change, but many of our modern social forms are simply not found in prior historical periods, such as the political system, the nation state, wholesale dependence of production upon inanimate power sources, and the thoroughgoing commodification of products of wage labor, and even sites of apparent continuity, such as cities, now ordered according to quite different principles from those which set off the pre-modern city from the countryside. So these are largely changes external to the individual and the individual mind by contrast, right? So that's the, the difference between modernity and tradition. By contrast, in post-traditional society, in late modernity, it's characterized by an internal change rather than external change. 
it's the rise of a new self, a reflexive self, reflexive, understanding your own position, understanding yourself, seeing how other people are seeing you. So the reflexive self does not merely occupy social roles, but creates for itself through its beliefs about the self, a new kind of self based on a person's own reflexive understanding of their own life. The kind of therapeutic self, which a person's self-deception depends on monitoring and continually revising their self-understanding. So modernity is characterized by a mixture of traditional and novel forms. Late modernity or post-traditional society is characterized by the reflexive self. Now, there are a lot of problems with this claim of novelty as a historical thesis. You know, the historical religions like Christianity, Judaism, Islam discovered the self. Early modern religion found a doctrinal basis to accept the self in all its empirical and ethical ambiguity. Modern religion is beginning to understand the laws of the self's own existence and to help man take responsibility of his own fate. So how do we date the reflexive self and the modern self? Is it really a product of an internal or an external change? So the pressures of modernization you know, just do not undermine idyllic societies of happy farmers whose lives would be perfectly happy if they were only left alone, right? That's a takeaway that many would get from reading Kevin MacDonald, that Europeans would have just been perfectly happy if they were only left alone by the Jews. So modernization provides the concepts to express doubts and demands that are already just below the surface of consciousness. It, modernity provides an atmosphere of hope, often realist, unrealistic, that things will soon get better. Now, Robert Bella is concerned with the coexistence of modern and traditional elements at the same time. So he presents an account of the good kind of modernization, one that tempers liberalism and individualism with modern versions of traditional collectivizing institutions that are functional substitutes for traditional institutions, but which support the autonomous individual without oppressing the individual. So this would apply to radical political movements like the alt-right. So according to Bella, modernization carries with it a conception of a relatively autonomous individual with a considerable capacity for adaptation to new situations and for innovation. So such an individual has a relatively high degree of self-consciousness and requires a family structure, the support of your family, right? In which his independence and personal dignity would be recognized where he can relate to others, not so much in terms of authority and obedience, but in terms of companionship and emotional participation. That sounds like our chat room. Like, I am not up here, you know, just firing down commands at you. I am not talking at you. I'm talking with you. I'm not talking in terms of authority and obedience. I'm talking in terms of companionship and, and full emotional participation. This is a safe space for you and for me, right? This is a place of love and inclusion, right? An individual in, in 40 University right? He, he requires a society in which he feels like a full participating member. Don't you yearn for that? Like you want a society whose goals you share and that you can meaningfully contribute to. And you require a worldview that is open to the future, that gives a positive value to amelioration of conditions in this world. Uh, am I not just reading your heart and your mind that, and, and can help to make sense of the disruptions and disturbances of the historical process? Right? That's the whole reason you come here. So this vision of modernity kind of echoes Herbert Spencer with respect to the demise of priestly authority and the rise of the autonomous contract-making individuals. Here we are. We're autonomous contracting-making individuals. I have no priestly authority. I'm just an ordinary bloke who likes to read books. But here we create a feeling. like We feel like we're a member of a group and we've got goals and we've got feelings. And we have a progressive social vision of solidaristic values like community, cohesion, that, that we're all in it together, right? So this, this community here at Forty University is a dramatic counterpoint to the excessive individualism uh, of contemporary America. So the 1930s and the 1940s gave us the no, new socialist man, man of the left with a collective orientation. You know, supposedly this orientation was a product of his maturity and autonomous choice, distinct from economic man who's enslaved to acquisition. So 
So there's a new relatively autonomous individual, Robert Bella, with his newfound self-consciousness. But is it really distinguishable from the reflexive self of Giddens and the optimistic autonomous self of Herbert Spencer? This is what Herbert Spencer says. The thief takes another man's property. His act is determined by certain imagined proximate pleasures of relatively simple kinds rather than by less clearly imagined possible pains that are more remote and of relatively involved kinds. But in the conscientious man, like the kind of man who watches this show, there is an adequate restraining motive, still more re-representative in its nature, including not only ideas of punishment, not only ideas of lost reputation and ruin, but including ideas of love and inclusion, of the claims of the person owning the property, of the pains which loss of it will entail on him. I mean, I would cry to think that I might take something from someone who owns it. Like, or joined with a general aversion to acts injurious to others. Is, is there any phrase that best sums up the quality of, of you in this show right now? You have this general aversion to acts injurious to others. I mean, that's, that's Forty University. So is Robert Bella's post-traditional autonomous individual is he acting differently from the liberal autonomous man? Okay, Herbert Spencer thinks this individual has morally desirable qualities resulting from experience and from experience congealed into tradition, while Bella does not. Is it that Bella, as his rejection of the chaotic society of Southern California from which he came, suggests does not think that people raised under the influence of individualism have these qualities? Or that, unlike Southern California, it is a society in which he feels like a fully participating member whose goals he shares and can meaningfully contribute to. Hey, you're listening to this right now. I hope you feel like a fully participating member of this community. The, 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 the goals that we have here, you share, and you also sense that you can meaningfully contribute to this society with you know, amazing, uh, amazing rhetorical discourses and super chats. All right? So there are, on the one hand, the language and the concepts of those people who have continued to live within a tolerably well-established moral framework with a well-established moral vocabulary, all right? Traditionalists, people on the right. So members of this social group have a list of what they take to be virtues and vices. They have a concept of virtues and the authority which requires the practice of virtues is not conferred by the agent's choice, right? Choices of moral standards are judged correct or incorrect in the light of their understanding of the virtues and vices. On the other hand, there are those individuals who have an entirely different moral vocabulary. They do not belong to a single homogeneous moral community with a shared language and shared concepts. Like here, we belong to a homogeneous moral community with a shared language and a shared concepts of, of love and inclusion, radical love and inclusion. But these other tosses, they find themselves solicited from different standpoints. They cannot avoid choice, and what moral standards they adopt depend on their own choices. So one day they may wake up and decide to become a Sheila. So choice is the fundamental moral concept for these blokes, and there are no objective and personal standards in the light of which ultimate choice can be criticized. Like I stand for objective and personal standards that, that go to God and Mount Sinai. So the greatest contemporary moral achievement, perhaps, is the creation of the type of community where shared ends and needs make possible the growth of a common life and a common commitment expressed in a common language. Isn't that what we're doing here? Now, that there is no such moral achievement on the horizon is the post-traditional condition. So individuals who are autonomous are forced to choose between standpoints, which then provide them with moral standards, but these are standards that conflict with these standards of others. So the problem of the actual existence of different moral standards, mostly driving from traditions, coexisting within the same community and faced with a problem of accommodating one another. That's not much of a community. So this gives us a new problem of multiculturalism. So either we accept something like a liberal framework of shared rules, but few shared ends, and we just treat individuals as autonomous bearers of culture who get along with one another under these rules, or as traditionalists, we can hope for a spiritual regeneration that overcomes differences. Or we can perhaps seek out you know, new values that allow for a positive relationship between cultures. 
So tradition once provided the basis for community, but it was rigid and it was oppressive and it crushed individual autonomy. A bloke couldn't get up in the morning, decide to become a Sheila. He couldn't get up in the morning, decide to shag the sheep or another bloke. All right. So, so this, this traditional community was based on exclusion rather than radical love and inclusion. And, and these traditions of family and gender, incredibly oppressive, right? You want to, you want to act out and get in touch with your, your female self? Not on, mate. Now, modernity has all these variety of cultures, which makes a return to this traditional kind of community impossible. So perhaps what we need is something different, something cosmopolitan. Maybe we need to you know, radically love and accept and include all this variety and just seek a peaceful way of accommodating all these different moral standards. But by appealing to cosmopolitanism as a solution, we're conceding that non-cosmopolitan, meaning mutual intolerance between traditions, is the root of the problem. So you can have the persistence of traditions in different cultural communities, right? Incredibly oppressive, but still powerful, right? But uh, do, do we need to accommodate it and recognize it and accept it as a good thing? So one solution, according to Giddens, is move past the mutually intolerant tradition and build a community based on active trust. Are you ready to join with me in creating an active trust community? Are you ready to join with me in building a positive spiral of trust building that creates a functional substitute for traditional community, builds obligation at the level of personal relations based on the communication of difference, right? Geared to an appreciation of integrity, right? This, this, this will be tradition free. Integrity does not require adherence to particular traditions. It transcends difference. It can be recognized in spite of difference. It can be understood in terms of the fulfillment of reciprocity, such as that the other is someone on whom one can rely, that the reliance has become a mutual obligation. So perhaps we can have obligation without tradition. Perhaps this will stabilize relationships that once we just meet that condition for mutual integrity. It's kind of a, an echo of Herbert Spencer's vision of society free from religion and based on trust between free contract makers. Pretty exciting stuff. So reflexivity, that's the distinctive characteristic of modern life, according to these great thinkers about the post-traditional world. So the reflexivity, the modern life consists in that social practices are constantly examined and reformed in the light of incoming information, peer-reviewed studies, mate. What does the New York Times have to say? What do the experts have to say? So we're, we're constantly act, altering and adjusting the social practices that we follow. So we've got the apparent continued role of tradition, but this is just an illusion. Because if tradition is justified reflexively, by how I understand it, it is no longer tradition. Justified tradition is tradition in sham clothing, receives its identity only from the reflexivity of the modern. So this way of making a distinction between mere modernity, which social practices are questioned, and post-traditionalism, which the self is created reflexively, kind of creates a model. Traditions persist in fact and in reality and need respect at least to enable dialogue between the adherents of different traditions. The existence of difference is a result of these persistent traditions and their communities, and this forces individuals into reflexivity and choice. So one must choose, right? The fact that one must choose, that itself marks a fundamental break with tradition. I chose to convert to Orthodox Judaism. That is not a traditional thing to do. You don't choose to convert to another religion, right? So you cannot wear a, a head covering or a headscarf as a continuation of a traditional practice. Where's the autonomy in that? Traditional practice is not a choice, but you can wear a head covering if you're making a choice based on your reflection on the practice of veiling. If you're choosing to affirm your identity as a paradigmatic act of a post-traditional reflexive, you know, act of self-creation. Right? So this kind of radical individualism is no longer merely an option. We are condemned to it. But weren't we condemned to it already by modernity? Isn't the justification of practices, which is supposed to be fundamentally changing the nature of the traditions we continue to accept, precisely the altering that produces, by definition, the reflexive self? So the general fact of reflexivity has turned all traditions into post-traditions by definition. 
that not only has any obligation of doctrinal orthodoxy been abandoned by the leading edge of modern culture, but every fixed position has become open to question in the process of making sense out of man in this situation. So we've got a profound commitment to process. We've got historic religions rediscovering the self. We found a doctrinal religious basis to accept the self in all its empirical ambiguity. So modern religion is beginning to understand the laws of one's own existence and to help man take responsibility. Effect been like on yours? Well, <laughs> I have three children. They're in their 20s. Well, actually, one is now uh, in her early 30s. That happens. Um, yeah. Uh, and um, they, <laughs> they always say, Mom, it's really lucky that we have a different last name than you. <laughs> Because uh, <laughs> I kept my name. I kept my name. But my kids have been totally cool about it. They are. Really? Yeah. They are very uh, strong and based. Um, and uh, they've really been terrific. Are they um, proud of your bravery, I hope? I think so. Um, my husband, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to say more about him, but he's uh, definitely been on my side, uh, but he has his own, you know, profession to worry about and his own situation to worry about. My youngest daughter, Esther, uh, who's now working in Philadelphia, when she was at Penn as an undergrad, she was on one of these discussion boards. They're all on them online. And some young woman went off about Professor Wax. Isn't she a witch? Isn't she a bigot? Isn't she a bitch? There's a lot of name calling I've noticed, as a substitute yeah. for thought, right? Which you know is sort of Gresham's law, yes, writ large. Uh, and Esther finally just wrote, you know, you know that that's my mother you're talking about. No way. And, yeah, good and for her. It was funny. And of course, this young woman immediately says, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I hope I didn't traumatize you and create an unsafe space. <laughs> Your words are violence. As there was, oh, well. Okay, that, that, that is a pretty good uh, story. All right, I'm, I'm building out to the climax of this Stephen Turner essay. So post-traditionalism depends on this idea of rupture, but our sense of rupture as well as our sense of continuity is subject to an important illusion. That illusion is illustrated by Robert Putnam's famous book, Bowling Alone which purports to show the decline in associational activities in the United States. So necessarily, this was concerned with associational activities popular in the past and their decline, such as the bowling leagues, which is referred to in the title. But it did not address, it could not address the development of novel forms of association, such as what we have here, right? We've got internet-based forms of association that have increased radically. We've got women's book clubs that have become more important. So if we do not take our eyes from the historical rearview mirror, we are doomed to always seeing traditions recede. Think about the concept of honor. On the one hand, it is a relic of the past. Honor is relative to rank, belongs to a society of ranks of the kind that Europe abolished and America never had. It was governed by such sanctions as dueling, which has declined. So when we encounter the forms of honor in other culture, they are alien and non-modern, such as honor killings. Now, in the 19th century, honor had a large role in German law, but the term is alien to Anglo-American law. But we do have laws of defamation. So did honor simply go away? Or did some of the external forms of honor change? So we have uh, Matthew joining the show. How's it going, Matthew? Hey Luke, uh, how are you? I'm a little, I'm a little uh, waking up, wiping the blood out of my eyes, so I won't use the camera if that's. Acceptable. No worries, no worries. So, uh, are we on now? Yes, we're we're live. So, do you have, uh, oh, cool. have some thoughts? Yeah, on so Amy Wax. I some thoughts on this. So, first of all, I want to make plain, just as a preamble, I think it's necessary throat clearing that I fully respect your right to free speech and uh, people who who feel afraid of having her in the same building. You have to, if you're a lawyer, you have to be around rapists, murderers, um, you have, you have all manner of clients and unpleasant people. So that's just something you're going to have to cope with. So I'm very strongly favor her free speech rights. Her comments here 
uh, I think are completely empirically baseless. Uh, the, the third world, if you go to the third world, generally speaking, this is borne out by polling data. I'll actually send you a link from India. The United States is quite popular, well-liked. Um, people admire the productivity, the freedom, the innovation of the United States. And uh, for her to generalize from woke kooks at the University of Pennsylvania, who I'm sure are just as anti-American if they're white or black or any color, uh, to, to characterize all Indians as like this and thinking America's terrible and having this hypocrisy with the with the caste system in India is just very unfair and has no empirical foundation. I mean, yeah. you can be irritated yeah. by individuals, but her projecting it to a whole ethnic group it strikes me as deeply unfair. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's just, it, it's incredibly reckless and, and stupid and self-destructive. Correct, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think she'll get fired for? And I, I, I imagine you're with me that she shouldn't be fired or disciplined. Correct. Yeah. But uh, do you, what do you think? What in terms of empirically, what do you think will happen um, to her with this? Well, because I, the comments are very. I mean, even even you and I, who are not politically correct, you know, uh, uh, um, found this to be very unfair to, to in, just empirically wrong, but also generalizing in a way that's not valid. Yeah, well, she's 69 years old. So, like, how much, how long does the university have to continue to employ her? I mean, this is interesting. As of 2019, Indians in India, not the United States, had a 56% um, favorability rating of Trump. Leave aside the US, they like Trump, yeah. right? Uh, probably because of the affinity Trump had with Modi. Um, and, you know, th there was some kind of, charisma between him and Indian nationalist communities. So it's just false. And you never encounter this woke. I mean, I've lived, you know, lived in the Middle East, mothers, Egyptian background, immigrant. Uh, the, the immigrants, actually, people who just arrived, and you, I wonder if you have the same experience, too, from the third world, non-white, if you will, immigrants. I see very little anti-American and anti-white sentiment from these people, and they seem to be very patriotic. And my family and others I've met, the, the, this, where you get that is this next generation of all races, where they're being propagandized with woke and incentivized by woke. That's my view. But what do you think? Yeah, I've never encountered anti-white hostility from Latinos or Asians. Mm -hmm. I've encountered a lot of it from from blacks. I've never encountered it from Latinos or Asians. Yeah, I mean, the. Hispanic uh, working class is also moving toward Republicans in terms of voting patterns. If you look at the uh, most recent polling data for the 2020 election, we, we first of all, we saw in the 2020 election, one of the biggest surprises in the results was uh, early in the night, if you recall, the betting markets, a lot of Democrats thought Texas is either is a coin flip, like because of how well they were doing in the urban centers and the suburbs. But then came the real ground and Republicans are like getting, you know, working class Mexican communities, essentially, right? Overwhelmingly yeah. working class Mexicans. And Trump was getting like 40, 45%, like winning some, you know, yes. just other shock. And that that sunk any chance Biden had to win Texas, which looked pretty good early in the night. So uh, there is there is this movement uh, toward the right among working class Hispanics. And, you know, her comments undermine uh, 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 the pushback against woke, which really needs to be to have any success, even at a pragmatic level, multi-ethnic, multi-racial, you know? Yeah, uh, my number one critique is if you're going to say something incendiary and you have anything to lose, it's self-destructive because you can you can usually find ways of phrasing, framing and phrasing what you want to say in, in a way that more people can hear. So instead of just like burning a bridge, now, why not build a right. bridge to other people and, and say things in a way that people can can hear without just immediately hating you? So uh, she fails on that scale, and then she provides no evidence, like just these assertions that because she sees some South Asians who are super woke in the University of Pennsylvania Med School, she's like she, a job requirement to work at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm sure to be. She, like she then generalizes woke. it to all South Asians and, and blacks and <laughs> and non Westerners. With, without right. any that any empirical basis beyond her anecdotal observation, which is just really bad reasoning. Correct. Yeah, and it's not a productive. It's just not a product. Look, 
the United States too has, and I also disagree. I like to, I don't want to call her names. You haven't been doing that either, Luke. So, but I've many on Twitter, that's a name. That's the general response. And I, in this case, it's more understandable than almost any other case where usually it's a controversial opinion being said. People say race, racist. Here she is. I understand why people are saying that because she is making generalizations that are derogatory and false. But nevertheless, even leaving all that aside, at an entirely uh, um, pragmatic level, these are citizens of the United States. And they're going to be citizens of the United States going forward, these immigrants from, from around the world. And, you know, you should, we should try to um, um, uh, altogether promote a patriotic, pro-American, positive view of ourselves, you know, um, rather than, I also would say this, that, you know, while Asians aren't like attacked by the woke media, they're not demeaned they are not beneficiaries of woke either i mean indians if you check the asian box on your application uh, this is the object of a harvard lawsuit brought by adam mortara and other people um <laughs> i actually knew that guy in law school vaguely i'm not going into that but i the guy who brought this brought the uh, lawsuit but um these folks are not beneficiaries of the woke system, particularly. They might not be rhetorically attacked the way whites are by woke, but you know, the Indian immigrants from if they're upper caste or whatever the case may be, they're coming and doing well academically, intellectually, and that's why they're getting positions. And another disappointing thing is that this is the time that she comes alive in the interview. So, so the first thirty minutes or so, it's just she's just droning. Because everything she's saying, she said 40 times before, but now she's saying something, something new and she just comes alive. So uh, part of what people will react to is your words, but also people react to your manner. And she is so excited to be, yeah. to be saying these things. Like she's suddenly like fully engaged, fully awake, fully alive, fully emotionally attuned to the situation. She's coming alive now to say these super self-destructive, unnecessarily inflammatory things. And again, if you look at the racist Indians, meaning the, the people who believe in the caste system in India are probably supportive of Trump right. and right wing generally. I mean, if they're Modi voters and they like the United States, not, and you know, liberal Indians don't like the caste. It isn't as if the, you know, going uh, back many, I'm no expert in India at all, but just as a historian, having read a little bit about India, you know, it's not as if there has that every um, uh, every expression of opposition and uh, contempt for the caste system has come from, you know, whites in the West, right? I mean, you have Gandhi, you have many Indian governments with affirmative action programs. I'm not saying that there isn't vast a vast legacy of institutional racism, if you will, in India, but um, it, it, the people who are liberal in India aren't like and anti-racism in India aren't saying, okay, racism is good if we do it. You know, they're against this stuff too, right? Yeah. And the people who are who, who have no problem with it and are happy to exploit it are probably among the majority of Indians who like Trump. Yeah, and let, let's say that there was some empirical basis. You know, let's say that there was a, a survey that came out that they interviewed 5,000 South Asians in America and 80% of them said they hated America. Okay. Then, then talk about that. Okay. There's a survey. Right. I mean, that would be shocking and disturbing right. and it's something we should talk about, but I'm sure like, it's not true. It's not accurate. Right. You know? Right. I mean, I mean, then, then you'd have something like empirical to respond to rather than just gratuitously coming out. And, and and saying this without, without also why are the these people so i am sure the anti-american anti-white views are from white women and white men at penn medical school too right right so this, these are just woke horrible institutions that don't reflect views in my view of people of any race and literally any race in the united states i think these institutions are unrepresentative of and kind of kooky frankly but why does she focus on the Indians who are doing this, I'm sure they are, at the people who need to send Americans who need to send at the Pan Medical School, and um, then project that on all Indians or most Indians in the United States are both pro caste system and 
you know. And frankly, I'm I'm sure that if you were to poll this, most Indian Americans, because first of all, a lot of Indians in India are against the caste system. Again, it's not as if uh, it's not as if this ha there haven't been federal efforts and efforts with big intellectuals and political figures to eradicate the system. So there are a lot of Indians against it in India, but I I would be overwhelmingly confident that. Indian Americans, namely people who have imbibed a liberal liberal values of the United States, right, are right. overwhelmingly against the caste system. They probably don't think about that much because they're in America, but you know, I'm sure they're not for it. Right. I mean, they're responding to incentives that we have set up. Uh, right. They're strongly incentivized to be morally outraged against white people because that's the system that we have created. Right. Yeah. The, the United States has created this bizarre. And other Western nations, mostly the, in the Anglosphere, really has created these bizarre incentive structures. Some of them are lying too; they don't even—they're not even genuine in their beliefs. Um, you know, if you look at the working class, though, um, I think being working class is slowly becoming a bigger predictor of how woke you are, whether you're working class or bourgeois. And of course, the people in bourgeois positions are more woke. I think, and I. I'm supported by the most recent polling data, which shows a very strong working class versus college degree split in the midterm election voting that that is going to be the big predictor of wokeness. Are you a truck driver? Do you work at a gas station? Are you a janitor? Are you, you know, a plumber versus like some kind of blue collar occupation versus are you a physician? Are you a lawyer? You know, and I think this is going to be the divide. I think we'll see more interesting surprises of the kind we saw in the 2020 election with the working class Mexican vote in the Rio Grande. And also people, I, I don't buy essentialism. People are not just woke. I understand mm -hmm. that that's shorthand, but, but there are plenty of people who are woke and who are going to be doing amazing things for the country. They're going to be good neighbors. They're going to volunteer and work with the homeless. They're going to create jobs. They're going to, you know, invent cures for diseases. They're going to, you know, send rockets in, into space. People aren't just one thing. People aren't just work or anti work. Right. And if you wanted to bet on who, who's more likely to come up with an important patent, like three generations of the working class, you know, 1,000 people who don't graduate high school, or, you know, one wokester uh, who, who went to Harvard or, or Yale, you know, I, I'd be betting that you're more likely to get important innovations from the person who I went said, to the elite though, I, I do think in the long run, if you look at the trend line, that this attack on meritocracy and assessments for intelligence that comes from woke will undermine um, the intelligentsia and, and, and even innovation, even STEM fields, I think. Um, I don't. I don't think I can empirically measure that yet, but I'm pretty confident it's the case that if we, um, as schools are doing, like eliminating, you know, intelligence testing like the SAT, ACT, um, I think that could spell trouble for our meritocracy. And I'll say this to the working class: I think uh, the multiracial working class will be the body, the political body that leads the pushback to woke. And also kind of like lower middle class, like petty bourgeois people, because people, th those people, I think also can help. Yeah, because but work, the problem is not a permanent if, condition. If, if you go to Yale or Harvard, you are either like a dissident and hiding as if you're like a homosexual in 1948. That's like how you behave if you are not woke in these institutions. You just, your whole life is a lie. You, you run to the bathroom, but instead of you're not running to the bathroom to give a man a blowjob, you're running to the bathroom to like say, oh, uh, like I'm, you know, I'm going to vote for Trump or whatever it is, you know? Woke's not a permanent condition. Woke people have kids. And and when a woke person has kids and he starts seeing dramatic differences between his male kid and his female kid, that that changes them. Uh, when woke people are forced into a situation where, let's say, Russia mm -hmm. cuts off energy to their, to their state and you know there are no green energy sources that are going to be able to meet the gap, they're going to suddenly have to confront reality. And... There are all sorts of situations right. where people are woke one moment, they get into a different situation, they stop being woke. And, and some people right. who are right-wing activists, their situation changes and they stop being right-wing activists. So people right. are not so, some immutable quality. People respond to incentives. 100% agree. And if you study history, as, as you have, Luke, um, and I, I certainly am, um, you see that 
peoples that we consider, like peoples are behaving in an utterly different way than their contemporary stereotypes. So the English, uh, the, the, the French are stereotyped as, um, as sympathetic to animals, as, as cultured people. And, you know, how medieval Frenchmen behaved is utterly different, like burning cats was a pastime in eras of medieval France. So I, I just think that the, empirically, the idea that um, the behavior of people is essentially driven by ethnicity or race is just an empirically false thesis. I, I think that there are many traits that are inherited, but I don't think values are one of them. I mean, there just has been way too much differentiation in values. I mean, you know, white people in the United States 200, year, 250, 200 years ago defended slavery. Uh, British people 110 years ago defended indentured servitude, you know? It's not that long ago even, right? And, and yet we find this all, we call that human trafficking today, um, indentured servitude. And obviously slavery we condemn as well. Yet uh, this would be like the hugest moral uh, sins you could commit, yet it's normalized just a few generations ago with genetically the same people. So I really think that institutions, far more than genetics affect uh, social values. I mean, frankly, uh, frankly, I'd even say something this provocative. If you go to um, uh, India today, the the average person, certainly educated people, but the average person, I would even say, is more liberal and uh, believes more in human rights than the average American did um, in 1780, let's say, or 1800. And again, that just shows you that it's not about genetics. It's about culture. It's about liberalism, right? Liberalism has emancipated us from our selfishness, from our exploitative character. And it has led us to indulge our compassionate side and our sense of concern for the other. And liberalism is spreading, and I'm, I'm very much in favor of that. I think woke it as a, as a threat to it, but not a huge threat to it, really. I think, I think liberalism will win over woke in the long run. And I, I, I don't understand why some people on the right are, think woke is so horrible that we should give up on liberalism to fight it. I mean, first of all, that's absurd because liberalism is what will be attractive to regular people, right? A liberal outlook where we don't treat people by ethnicity, et cetera. You know, I could go through platitudes, but, you know, a liberal outlook is what would appeal to regular people. Yet, um, the these national conservatives want this weird new movement that has all this esoteric references, is like vaguely theocratic, you know, no, we just need liberalism. Liberalism is working. It's been working for centuries. It's making people around the world much better. And and Amy Wax uttered the phrase white values. There's no she meaningful, said this? Yeah. There, there's no I don't, meaningful see, white I don't values. think this is true. Like there's a ton of politically incorrect truth. There's enough politically incorrect truth to go around <laughs> without needing to make up uh, politically incorrect falsehoods like white values yeah. was burning cats a white value um you know in medieval france or even because right now have... you know let's say white values in america in 2022 what does that I mean, mean? Yeah, what, what do white mean... people in america right now have in common almost nothing right yeah i mean you can look at working class versus um but i mean look at america you know 300 years ago well not 300 years ago but 200 years ago let's say or even today compare like russia predominantly white country the values of russians are very different than the values of americans the values of moldovans are very different than those of french you know this isn't this just isn't empirically true right it's not empirically true i mean i'd say the same thing for for christian jewish and muslim just saying christian values muslim values and Jewish values, it means nothing. Now, if you want to say uh, Lithuanian Jewish values, uh, you want to talk about, um, I don't know, some city in Nigeria, if there's a big Christian community there, you might start to get some, some meaningful uh, correlations with Christian values, but, but yeah, there's especially nothing either. that Jews share in common. You know, most American Jews at... don't care about Israel. Right. Or look at, um, I mean, even with Muslim, like, I do think that the plain language of religious texts has some power, but I think it's very limited. And yeah. here's how I defend that claim. Look at, okay, you can, Islam is the is the one people like to, um, to, um, uh, to pick on because there is high rates of, of support for criminalizing homosexuals, some, for some things in more radical uh, hadith like the sayings of the prophet that you, you can find widespread support for in the Muslim world. But yet you go to like, 
uh, the North Caucasus. I mean, leaving aside Chechnya, which is obviously an extreme Muslim case, if you go to like the North Caucasus in the Russian Federation, like Kabarina, Bulgaria, or 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 um, you go, you know, to Tartarstan, which is in the Caucasus, which is predominantly Muslim. I mean, these people are intermarrying with Russians. They are drinking. They're having premarital sex, and it's not controversial. And yet, they're Muslim. You know, you, you go to Turkey. Nine the most of the religious conservatives don't want Sharia law. They're against Sharia law, according to the same poll Sam Harris parades around. Like eleven percent of Turks favor Sharia law. So I think all of these, and, and look, even America, like most Christians support gay marriage now. So I think that the literal meaning of text isn't that it has no no power, but it's the power is much weaker than people think. Yeah, it, it's situational. It's contingent, like everything else. Right. Contingent meaning depending on other things. So, for example, there is sometimes a dramatic difference between white values and black values, say, with regard to the O.J. Simpson verdict. Uh, sure. 80% plus of whites were outraged by the verdict. About 80% plus of blacks thought it was fantastic. All right, that's that's a black white values difference. Like at a particular time in a particular place, you get a, a black white di difference. But generally speaking, of white values, it doesn't have any meaning. Right, and uh, again, I just I would just reiterate that I think empirically, if you study history, um, the idea that one racial group was associated with a certain type of values is completely untenable and laughable. Yeah. Now. You can talk about other inherited traits, and I'm not saying there aren't inherited traits that are relevant, but in terms of values, like is slavery wrong? Is indentured servitude wrong? Is sex with a, a fucking like 12 year old wrong? It wasn't wrong in medieval Christendom, um, as bizarre as that may seem nowadays. It's actually, that's something I've been considering writing for TAC, although I don't think I'm going to, uh, because I, I, like hearing all this debate about traditional values, groomer, all this, I mean, <laughs> I, as somebody who who studies history, you know, in the 19th century, child marriage to like a, an older man was was legitimate. If you had bled before the late 19th century, uh, you know, generally speaking, 12, 13, uh, this age was considered within the age of consent in, in European nations. I think in the Napoleonic Code, it was 11 or 12. Catholic Church was 12. Most American states were 12. Before, and then in the late 19th century, you get liberalism saying this is wrong because of consent. Sexual morality should be based on consent because we're liberals. It shouldn't be based on duty. on the. It shouldn't be based on the purity of the woman or, or her virginity uh, until marriage. It should be based on consent. So I don't know. I, I guess I'm, I'm sort of a, a liberal chauvinist. And I think that a lot of the claims that whether it's racialists, I don't want to put words into Wax's mouth, but she does kind of sound like she's advocating these views. Whether it's racialists or radical traditionalists, I think the claims they make about um, are just false empirically. Like liberalism has made us much better. Everybody. So what do you think about uh, the, the transgender movement? That's that's an extension of, of liberalism. People even get the right to choose their well, Unfortunately, own I'm going to have to... Um, <laughs> I'm going to have to take the coward's way. I don't yeah, want to get into trouble. That's smart. In that's, my, that's very smart. In my, in my program. I will say this. I have uh, compassion for people. I don't think that if you feel that way, you're, you've are you harmed anybody. Um, but, you know, the, the, the rest of my opinion, I'll keep to myself. But why, I, why I don't should... think, I will say this. I don't think ridicule, which is often the response, is the mm -hmm. right response. But I don't. Nor do I agree with the idea of uh, the ideas of the left on all of these issues. Let's say, what what traditional societies would you be most comfortable in? You know, traditional as opposed society. to liberal. Okay, I don't want. I want a liberal society. I don't want a traditional yeah. society. You don't want to live I mean, in a tra traditional society. Most of the traditionals, yeah. the people who call themselves traditionals, it's another thing that's funny. So Rod Dreyer thinks, you know, and I'm going to be. <laughs> I actually there's more free speech there than at university, so I could I could bash him, although I won't, um, because he writes for the same magazine I do, and he's a big dog, and I'm just a, a random guy who writes reviews every, you know, several months. But Roger seems to think that the tra so-called traditional values he grew up with in the '70s, '80s, that that's what was going on hundreds of years ago. I mean, <laughs> basically the the new construction, the the traditional values he grew up with, sexual mores were an attempt to cope with feminism, with the victories of feminism. So 
they applied chastity ethics to men. Instead of getting rid of chastity ethics, they applied them to men, even though traditionally they were not applied to men. Like Augustine, you know, it was considered a sin under Islam or Christianity for men to have premarital sex. But it was also considered inevitable. Men will stray. This is why Augustine, uh, for example, supported legal prostitution, because he thought it's a natural thing for men to express themselves uh, sexually. And, um, you know, so so you're going to you should have prostitution so you don't uh, spoil virginity of women. So women aren't having premarital sex because there needs to be a way for men to. But Dreyer grew up with the values that chastity is for everyone, including boys. And, and this and, and this is really an attempt by traditionalists to cope with feminism, victories of, of first and second wave feminism. Yet Dreyer thinks this is what like the church has stood for through the ages, even though the church, like with it, as I mentioned earlier, had the age of consent of 12, was, you know, often took a casual view of prostitution when the papal states, when the church had actually had state power. Um, I guess he's not a Catholic anymore, so I shouldn't associate him with Catholicism. But I just think that even so-called traditionalists are liberals in many of their views, as they should be, right? Yeah. I don't think that they're actually <laughs> abiding by um, uh, Christian theocracy. Right, pre-liberal Christian theocracy. I think they'd find grotesquely immoral. Yeah. Uh, what happened to your uh, upcoming space? Is Putin, Hitler, Mister Bond sentence? Did you do anything with that? Oh yeah, that didn't that didn't um, work out, unfortunately. Um, do you remember I, I what you wanted to we say? We didn't advertise it. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think I was going to talk about where Putin lies in the Russian political spectrum. I mean, I was going to make a similar arguments I've made on your stream before that okay. it's irresponsible to call him Hitler, although the war is obviously deeply immoral, and I'm, I'm not I'm not defending the invasion, obviously, but I, I think I've said these views before. Yeah. But uh, the more interesting thing I think was to talk about where Putin lies on the Russian political spectrum. Is there because anything I mean, in that conflict, Ukraine versus Russia, since we spoke last, that? Uh... You found particularly I haven't intriguing. been following it much. Yeah. I find it, I just find it very depressing. First of all, I feel sad for the Ukrainians. Um, I also think that we're not going to be able to sort out how many how much of the allegations are true, what allegations are true until after the fog of war settles. But certainly uh Ukrainians are, are being killed and, and suffering terribly. And I, I think it saddens me. And you know, the whole I have a, a personal a special distaste for this because of my of the Russians that I, my I life and because I, I, I see this as interpreted in a very anti-Russian way, not just an anti-Putin way, of course, which I wouldn't object to, but an anti-Russian way. So the coverage of it rather depresses me and I, I just have been checked out of it um, for the last uh, couple of weeks. Although I'm thinking about writing an article about where Putin lies in the spectrum because of, uh, it's interesting how these far left and far right people in America have come to support him. Although, you know, it's still, I was on the fringes. Have you ever thought about becoming a baron? Maybe you can purchase one from mm -hmm. Africa somewhere. Okay, how does that work? I don't know. You have to talk to Joseph Cotto. Uh, I'm not saying he purchased his, but he's Baron Joseph Cotto. Wow, so, that's a good idea. Yeah. I mean, how much are they going for? Then you all have to call me that. Like your audience has to. I think that's illegal. Yeah, thing yeah. To. First Baron Cotto. Be a lord. Yeah, maybe. or Lord, maybe you could be, maybe you could become Sir, Sir, like you know, Sir, Sir Jimmy Savile. You could be Sir, you know, Matthew Gobrel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, or just Sir, you know. I mean, but you'd have to remember in every like, if you want to interrupt me, you'd have to say, "Pardon, my pardon, sir, my Lord," or something like that. Uh, my my lady. Did Joe actually get a? Um, did Joseph Carter actually get a lordship or something? He's a baron. Yeah, he got one from Africa. Why? <laughs> I think he got scammed. I think mean, it sounds like. Does he get like some kind of land? Um, he got a sash. He's got a pretty stylish outfit out of it. That's pretty cool. So, did was that like the cost of a of a steak dinner in in Texas, or was that a serious investment? No, this is serious, serious. Um, I mean, this becoming a baron, it just totally changes your life. I mean, people just start treating you. Oh, so he's like an aristocrat now. He doesn't have yeah, to Yeah, yeah, he's, he's a monarchist and an aristocrat. He has like a household, you know, of maids, 
um, oh, uh, yeah. chef, yeah. ghost riders, yeah. gardeners. Yeah, he's got he's um, the big spiritual bad. advisors. Yeah. yeah, he's got a whole community that depends on. Is he him. a minor lord or a major lord? Which country is this, by the way? I, I don't know. One of those African ones. Yeah. So, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa or North Africa? I don't know. I don't see geography. Oh, I don't see so color, weird. and I don't see geography. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering if he's um, if, if Joseph is black. I don't think he's black. I, no, I but he's um, he's a baron. You can buy if if look if the law of the lands, just if the law of America says immigrants can come as it does, and it frankly has worked for the, the United States is such a rich country. Our our the, the, the stupidest thing about woke is like, for all of our problems, there's a lot going for us. There's so many opportunities in this country, and you know, there, there are people who are, who would bend over backwards around the world to come here from, you know, all, all kinds of countries, from the vast majority of countries, really. So we have so much going for us, and it's, we're, we're kind of stabbing ourselves in the, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of um, cutting off our nose to spite our face with the woke stuff, and also the kind of Amy Wax racialist stuff, I think, too. It's, it's just not productive. Just as woke isn't productive, why not? Why not oppose both, right? And, and people will say, "Oh, you're just cucking." Well, you know, they'll call you if, if you want to be criticized. They will call you a neo-Nazi for simply saying anti-white stuff is bad. So why would you, if your goal is to be provocative, you're already going to be considered provocative in this crazy woke culture. You can be provocative without being racially hateful. Is my point. So you can have both. Not like be able to sleep at night because you're not demeaning like millions of people glibly based on who are objectively innocent right because you know um if you're demeaning people based on race you're not you're there's nothing they um could have done or omitted to do that prevents there from being demeaned by you right you're you're demeaning innocent people whether they're white or black or whatever um so you don't have to do that you can be a decent uh liberal moral person and still be edgy and be criticized if that's what you're into, because the system will call you racist for saying anti-white stuff is bad. That is sufficient. So Amy so Wax wanna... also, she called uh, India a shithole country. Do you think that's uh, an objective fact? I, I just, you know, I just think it's a narrow view. Um, I mean, a lot of um, human innovation has come out of India. Uh, you know, the, the Buddhist religion, uh, for example, came out of India, which a lot of people, a lot of Westerners have found spiritual insights in Buddhism in terms of the um, uh, need to, uh, Schopenhauer, and philosophers as well, Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer wasn't some politically, <laughs> wasn't some politically correct <laughs> man. Right. You know, uh, um, and he found great wisdom in, in uh, Eastern uh, mysticism and so forth. Um, you know, uh, so I think it's ignorant and narrow and a little sad because someone with her platform and her, she, cause she's, she's brave. She's willing to criticize, yes. um, um, you know, she's willing to express views that are socially unacceptable, but I just wish she'd be doing that in a way that's positive for the United States and is not demeaning huge groups of people. Right. Um, so no, I don't agree with that. I think. Um, I think that you lack a certain, you la you're kind of viewing the world in, in very materialistic terms if you just deride the, this entire country as a shithole, in my view. Is, is shithole a widely accepted academic category for different types of civilizations? <laughs> I wonder. I actually emailed her. Um, I, 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 I used, like, obviously a civil tone to try to differentiate myself from, like, screaming woke people. But I didn't say that you're empirically um, wrong about this. I didn't say you're racist or whatever. I, I just gave the data about how, you know, people in all these uh, developing third world countries, brown people, as it were, Af and also people from Africa, um, like the United States. It's, it's when people come here and are propagandized by our system, which is in which most of the powerful people are white, by the way. I'm not saying there aren't non-whites pushing this garbage. There are, but they're mostly whites are, right? In terms of the, because they hold most of the power positions, um, then they get propagandized into it here, or they may not even believe it, but they're incentivized, as you say, to pretend to believe it. So, I mean, it isn't some intrinsic quality of, like, it's just to say the third world is just motivated by resentment of the West. It's such a narrow view and, and wrong. It's just so wrong. I lived in the Middle East for two years. America's quite popular. Israel isn't popular, but 
That's a that's a different kettle of fish. That's not about envy. Ah, you know? uh, Jews, white. <laughs> um, I, I mean, Mizrahi Jews, I think, could be called non-white. I don't really understand Ashkenazi saying they're not white, but I don't really care if they want to say they're white or not. I mean, <laughs> Eric Stryker, uh, by the way, on Telegram um, has said has implied that Amy Wax. I'll send you the link. Has implied that Amy Wax is trying to um, lot is is trying to trick whites with this. Um, yeah. With her, you saw this already. No, no, but it just she's playing three D chess. Yeah, exactly. She, she she looks Jewish and she is lying about the origins of political correctness and wokeism. I don't even think did she even mention the origins. These people are just so. It's so obvious that they're trying to cram all the data in the world into their narrative. So this is obviously a counterexample from the narrative that Jews are anti-white. And that's the motivation of all this, because she's like essentially exposing. And again, this is so overused, but she's essentially exposing white nationalist views, in my view. I mean, honest, like, you know, you're not that those, these are the ter she's just demeaning all ethnic groups. I'm sorry. Right. Like, I don't want to call people that who aren't like I would never call Charles Murray a white nationalist. Right. He doesn't express those views. But Wax seems to be a white nationalist. I mean, honestly, maybe not, maybe that's unfair, but she certainly, she's a fellow traveler. She agrees with many of their views, right? And she kind of agrees with this denigration of, of other ethnic groups, you know. What do you think about uh, our government's reactions to COVID? I'll, I'll say my opinion first. So I think that our elites and our politicians did uh, pretty much the best they could. And I accept that there may be a wide range of uh, uh, policies that would be appropriate, but I think, generally speaking, our academic yeah. elites, our health elites, and our, our political elites did, did the best they could with a difficult situation, and I think they got overall more things right than wrong. And I think that uh, lockdowns were appropriate in, in uh, most instances that they instituted instituted lockdowns that those were that those those were good calls and um i think getting vaccinated is is a good call and uh, social distancing i think was appropriate uh, for a time and uh, wearing masks uh, particularly when you're indoors around other people i think is is uh has been a, a good idea so overall i think the elites and the politicians and the 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 people with power got more things right than they got wrong with regard to COVID and the lockdowns. What say you? Mm -hmm. Well, I have a strong view on one of these issues, and then I'm going to have to express agnosticism on the others because I just haven't read enough to know. Um, I strongly think the vaccines, people should get vaccinated. Um, you know, <laughs> inoculation, say, say, protects yourself and others around you. There's been this claim going around kind of anti-woke Twitter, and I'm sympathetic, obviously, to anti-woke people but there's this claim going around glenn greenwell repeated this jimmy Dore repeated this that you're actually not protecting others if you get inoculated because um the chance that you transmit covid assuming you have covid the chance that you transmit it is no different according to some studies than uh, for vaccinated versus unvaccinated but this is obviously a fallacy because you're <laughs> if you're vaccinated your chance of getting covid is far lower so you need to get it to transmit it. Ergo, since your chance of getting it is far lower, and there's no difference between your chance of passing it on if you have it, obviously getting vaccinated protects others. And it protects oneself. I mean, the lethality of the disease is decimated by inoculation. So people should get vaccinated and the state should make it. I don't believe, I don't believe in a law requiring people to get vaccinated because I think that forcible medical procedures I have a kind of libertarian. I have enough of a libertarian streak, not a very pronounced one, but enough that that disturbs me, even if it could be justified in some utilitarian basis. But certainly we shouldn't incentivize getting inoculated. And, you know, there was another, there was a guy who died. Uh, have you read lourockwell.com? A little bit. Okay. Um, it's like a libertarian website. Yes. A lot of crank, crackpot stuff on the on scientific issues. There was a, a guy who wrote for them for many years, associated with Ron Paul, incidentally. Um, there was a guy who wrote for them for many years, Bill Sardi, who, who died last week. He believed 
he said COVID is a hoax or it's exaggerated or the vaccine doesn't work. And he died, according to the death certificate of, of COVID, was one of the contributing factors. So this does kill real people. And the evidence is very strong in inoculation. So we should we should be getting vaccine. Now, in terms of the lockdowns and other stuff, I just haven't read enough to know how effective this was. I think that the lockdowns were very grave infringements on liberty. And I need to see a very compelling empirical basis for their being effective, highly effective to justify them. My intuition is to be against lockdowns, um, fr the lockdowns, frankly, but I haven't read enough to have an opinion that I'd be willing to uh, stand by, but very strongly support those vaccines and providing incentives to get them, but not forcing. Yeah, it's interesting it, for, for our, our different perspectives. I, I think you're more of a, you're more of a classical liberal, uh, I'm more of a a nationalist, and so I'm I'm not as wedded to rights. Uh, I view rights as you know so heavily contingent, and I understand that they can be you know, ripped away at any time when there's when there's a uh, when there's a, a situation that that changes. But uh, for for a liberal, uh, the the lockdowns and the, the social distancing policies must be yeah particularly hard to. To handle because I don't, right. you know, I think rights are nice, but you know, I don't don't view them with the. Well, I don't believe do. in I don't believe in um, natural rights, um, but I believe that rights, and I also so I not only don't think that metaphysically the concept of natural rights is absurd. First of all, additionally, I recognize that the notion of natural rights, which implies a kind of human rights, really, because if you're a if you're a man or a woman or whatever. <laughs> I'm not going to get into a gender joke, you know, but it was tempting there to be honest. Um, the, uh, it, it, you know, if you're a human being, you had entitled to these rights, right? So natural rights is implicit in that is a doctrine of human rights. This is not the historical norm. Historical norm is slavery, serfdom, oppression, exploitation, um, you know, exploitation of women, um, child marriage, very common history. Um, marrying minors, just the idea of that individuals are entitled to some level of autonomy is not character. And then, of course, you have war and conquest, and murder by the state in this regard. So these are not, um, as we sometimes talk about, like people, you know, on the far right are certainly correct. Fascists are correct that this is not <laughs> characteristic of history. Um, however, I think it's a really good idea. I also think that there's something in us even if it's been dormant for most of human history, there is some capacity for compassion to the other. And we need to create institutions that tap into that. And I think human rights doctrine does. And I think it's had an effect. I mean, people do, even people who like some racist fuck in, in Texas does not, does not think like indentured servitude is right the way he would have before, um, um, uh, you know, before, um, uh, before human rights became like a norm, right? He doesn't have any notion of human rights. He probably would make fun of it and say it's stupid. But he does have some implicit notion that you treat the other not so bad, you know? Yeah. I'm so uh, I, yeah, I, I I I think we agree on the, if you will, the metaphysics of it. I think we agree on the history of it, that this is not how human history has proceeded. But I think it's a good idea and I think it has it has efficacy. Um, and I think that since notions of, and I also think it's implicit in earlier liberalism, the notion of human rights, because natural rights doctrine, the idea that, which I, I, I don't support obviously metaphysically, but I, I think is a, is a good construction. I like it as a social construction, if you will, Th that implicit in that is a notion of human rights, because if, 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 if you know, if, if one comes about this naturally by virtue of being human, then obviously there's an egalitarianism regardless of nationality in liberalism. So, yeah, I mean, I'm rambling a bit, but I uh, think we it's agree. A, it's a great, I think we agree on the facts, yeah. but... Yeah, um, I mean, the, the COVID was just a fascinating uh, situation for, for I people. I need to find good evidence. But, but, well, because I don't believe in natural rights and because I think this is just a highly useful and beneficial construction, I am open to suspending rights in certain circumstances, right? Because I don't believe they're like these, you know, inalienable things, <laughs> as the Constitution says. But I'd have to find very convincing evidence 
uh, the efficacy of the measures that were taken. So how bad is the situation in Australia? I hear it's like a, I haven't looked into this seriously, but the kind of libertarian or right wing. I, I found it a utopia. I mean, there are then about one fiftieth the per capita death rate of the United States, and wow. was was the price for that uh, that you just had to check in on your iPhone every time you entered a store, or it had to show verification of vaccination. I don't see that as a problem. So very low death rate, and. Yeah, people in Australia have much more of a sense that the government's on their side. They have more trust of the government, and the government does seem to work a little bit more efficiently and and effectively. And overwhelmingly, people went along with it. Like people, also in the United States, people supported tougher COVID measures than were actually enacted. It, it wasn't that the government, you know, imposed lockdowns on people nearly as much as people wanted them. And uh, so, too, in Australia, when you have a deadly disease that uh, is, is killing hundreds of thousands of people and you, yeah. have, you have ways of minimizing it. So the, the, price of the, the price of COVID measures in Australia that I had to pay was just uh, checking on my phone. Uh, also, when I, I got to Australia, I had to, I had to get a COVID test to even travel to Australia. I could only go to Australia because I was an Australian citizen. I had to... I was. I would get a text message from the government once I arrived in Australia after a few days mandating that I go get another test or paid for by the, the government that uh, each state in Australia had their own policies. So you couldn't, you couldn't travel to another state until about th- a month into my stay in Australia. And then there was a whole, you know, bureaucratic process. I just wondered, you know, what would 100 IQ people do to get through that? Like there are all these hoops that you had to jump through. And then we got out, for example, we got our COVID test and then began the 12 hour drive to the Queensland border. You know, we, we could have been, you know, we could have driven a thousand kilometers, you know, and found out we tested positive and not be able to get in. But so there was uh, things you had to do online. You had to get a test. Then you had to get a test result. And then you had to show all that to the customs officer as you're entering Queensland. So I also had to get a special test to, to fly back. So I was probably out. Uh, I was out $400 uh, total. And I was probably out uh, several hours of uh, uh, 12, 12 hours of inconvenience or told. But uh, I, I think the Australia's dealt with the COVID uh, threat uh, in, in a fairly rational and effective manner. So how punitive is the um are, are the consequences for non because again well again, it depends it, but, but generally speaking it's, it's fairly punitive like uh if okay. you five thousand dollars like if you don't wow like so when there was a lockdown and there was a series of, of jews that insisted on holding rosh hashanah services i think they all had to pay a fine of there was equivalent of five thousand american each which was like eight thousand australian <laughs> i'm laughing for a second my mind is on the I just remembered that. So it's kind of funny if the, the right stuff guys, Stryker and Enoch. And the beginning of COVID, they were saying, when they took COVID seriously, they were they they actually, unlike some folks in the conspiracy theory, anti-Semitic conspiracy theorist community, they actually were saying, no, oh, this is real, it isn't fake. But and then they were blaming Jews because of this Orthodox, you know, meeting and so on. Jews for spreading COVID, and then they turn just seamlessly to Jews are pushing the lockdowns. Yeah, it's just like obviously the obviously the first principle is Jews are to blame, and you're not you're just trying to conform the facts. Up. Anyway, let's get back. That's why I was giggling. But let's get back on on the subject. Um, but so, wh- one, so people one, incarcerated for uh, non-compliance. I I'm not sure. I'm sure maybe someone somewhere, but the more more common thing was uh, a fine of, of approximately. Five thousand. That's quite a bit, though. I mean, that's that's a lot of money for. Yeah, I mean, but that's people. real. I mean, if you want to take it seriously, right. that's that's what you need to do. So to true, me, and, and the death rate just is way lower there. That is an interesting consideration. Again, I I haven't studied this data, these data. You say technically, um, I haven't studied these data uh, systematically. But but you say that there really is. Uh, there was a, it just was decimated the rate of death. I mean, the reason this is serious, uh, the arguments from the right wing have been very bad on this. So. The rate of death from COVID isn't what is so horrifying. What's horrifying is how quickly it spreads, you know? So 
if if everybody in the population could get something with a two percent, and I don't know the exact figure, but before the inoculation, I think it was something like two percent, one point five percent. I don't know exactly. Don't hold me to that. But if everyone in the population gets that, that's millions of deaths, you know. And moreover, uh, there are certain groups where the risk is quite high. If you're old or obese or what have you, you know, or have asthma, so. I, yeah, I mean, I don't agree with the right wing crackpot stuff on this, but my inclination is also to be skeptical of policies like Australia. But, you know, that's a relevant consideration if deaths, deaths were just way lower in Australia, way lower. So th- there was one time, the first time I went to synagogue, I, I didn't think about this. So I didn't I didn't bring my phone with me because it was coming up on Shabbat. So I didn't have proof of my vaccination status. So I couldn't, I couldn't go to synagogue uh, one on Friday evening. So, you know, that, that sucked. And of course, you know, people in businesses that, uh, depended upon, you know, in-person traffic, I mean, they were devastated, but I think governments did a really good job in the West by and large of cushioning the blow. Like we, we heard early on about there'd be food riots and people starving and, and, uh, you know, people wouldn't be able to pay the rent and, uh, by and, you know, by and large, we we miss that because the Fed, Federal Reserve got involved, central banks got involved, governments got involved. Uh, they you know they subsidize people, so you know we 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 dodged a bullet. And of course, there's a lot we don't know about COVID. Like, what are the long term implications for people who who caught it? I mean, how many of them will have you know long term problems? In the face of skepticism, though, I think we need to have liberty but what we do know is is frightening because as you say uh, you know as, as i mentioned millions uh, have died from this because of how it's just insanely contagious you know if the flu were this contagious the flu would be horrifying we'd kill huge numbers of people you know I mean, it's more much more lethal than the flu but uh, the contagion factor i think is what is what scared people so much with this yeah, and you know, the, again, there's the so much we don't know. We don't know what are the the repercussions. So uh, to me, it made sense. It was a rational decision for individuals to take some measures to delay catching it, because our therapeutics were going yeah. to improve. Our we we would know more and more about what works. So early on, and now we have we have uh, medication that is effective too. You know, we had no we had no uh, other important reminder is 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 that we had no effective as you're reminding me of actually is beginning of this thing we had no effective treatment for it that was another thing that freaked people out well we we got better as it went along initially people were put on ventilators then we found out 90 percent of people who put on ventilators died so you you want to really not put people on 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 ventilators like we we learned smarter ways of, of dealing with this and so when there's there's some unpredictable epidemic hitting yeah you want to try to to delay catching it um, of course, you know, everything's a weighing up of, of various options. So for me, I did not go to synagogue for a year, right? That's how, wow. that's how seriously I took it. I did not. Orthodox... Matthew, you keep interrupting me, man. Sorry, sorry. You, you got to let me. I'm a little fucked up today. Go yeah, on. yeah, yeah. So I basically didn't socialize for, for approximately a year. So to the extent I did it, we, we socially distanced it and wore masks. So. That's how seriously I took it. How seriously did you take it? Um, well, I have, I have a quick question for you first, and I'll yes. tell you uh, how I approach it. So how did the Orthodox, you're Orthodox Jewish, right? Yes. Okay. How did the Orthodox Jewish community in general react to the lockdowns? Were they resentful of it? Were they skeptical of COVID anecdotally and also empirically if you have any? Yeah, the, the modern ones were, were fine with it because the modern ones go to university. The mm-hmm. traditional ones who didn't go to university were much more opposed to the lockdowns. But uh, th- there was a trend that even many of the traditionalists came around to the importance of, of locking down when they saw more and more of their their, their fellows dying of COVID, right? So mm-hmm. that that wonderfully, wonderfully concentrated the mind. Yeah. As for me, I um, always am with no... Um, <laughs> with no complaint or hesitate or like any really <laughs> internal agitation masked um, um, you know, indoors, obviously outdoors yeah. is very different mask outdoors, but indoors I masked because it seemed very logical 
that, you know, like the flu, this, this spreads through sneezing and coughing and so on. Um, so you, you masking makes lo logical sense. So I was happy to do that. And I thought that was a social, a social thing to do. Um, I got the inoculation right when I was available, when it was available. I didn't have any hesitation with that either. Um, I read a little bit about like studies on, on the effectiveness of the vaccine. It's quite impressive. So on the other hand, I wasn't, um, tying myself into knots to avoid any risk. So for example, I went to my, so I went to Turkey recently, but I went to Turkey before that, actually, at the end of 2020, um, I went, I traveled overseas. But before you were vaccinated, you traveled to Turkey. Correct. Yeah. Which was a risk now. Yeah. Um, which I suppose was a risk to myself and to others, if I'm being honest. I wanted to uh, meet my girlfriend. Uh, this was when we uh, were flirting on the internet, and I really wanted to meet her. Um, and I just thought she was special, and still think that, obviously. By the way, we're going to live together in uh, Berlin. I'm checking out apartments uh, uh, this morning after after we talk. I'll go to breakfast, and then I'm going to go look at a couple apartments. But that's neither here nor there. I did go to... Um, uh, Turkey, though, so I traveled, and I obviously I sat in a plane. I was wearing a mask, but I sat in a plane. I walked through an airport, and th that entailed risk uh, for transmitting COVID, right? Um, but I didn't get it. Um, I would have felt guilty if I got it and spread it, but I, I, I was very selfish there, I suppose. Um, and not so I, I love the I love the epistemic challenge of COVID, and also the epistemic challenge of the voter fraud claim. So with both of them. My, my reaction was fairly quickly to find what's the best book on this topic. So early on in COVID, I read the, the best book on the Spanish flu. So when, when I saw the severity of the Spanish flu, where 40, 60 million people around the world died, I became much more open to government restriction measures to COVID. And then when I read a book, The, the Myth of Voter Fraud, I, I, saw, I, I felt like I, I saw through these spacious claims of voter fraud. So that's probably my primary epistemic approach to, to topics I don't know anything about is to read, say, what's the number one book on this topic and then and then work work out from there. Yeah. Um, but you took it you took it seriously uh, throughout the process. Then. Only because I, I read that book on the Spanish flu. So I didn't have any opinion until I read that book on the Spanish flu, which I did in March 2020. And after I read that book, after I read the descriptions of, you know, millions of people dying horrible deaths and how devastating this flu was and how that there seems to be like a devastating influenza about every century or so, I, I yeah, I took it seriously and I did not automatically dismiss uh, government lockdown policies. Now, I, I feel like I was kind of centrist. I didn't automatically accept what uh, medical authorities w were saying and, and political authorities. I didn't automatically assume that they were doing the right thing, but I did not follow the populace and automatically assume that they were doing the wrong thing. Yeah. So um, what do you think of, uh, what do you think of the morality of, of COVID, uh, like, like conduct regarding COVID? So let's say you're unvaccinated and not wearing a mask. You're just walking into like, <laughs> you know, a place where you'd find elderly people, like a casino, let's say. Uh, do you think that person is, I just kind of want to see what you, what you think in terms of ethics. Yeah, what, what, this was a big thing for me because most of my audience was, I'm going to do what I like mm -hmm. because I'm a man and I'm not a wimp. And, and my response was, so it, how many people would have to die as a result of your actions before you'd rethink what you're doing and nobody wanted to rethink it's like oh well they would they would probably have it coming you know they were just weak and uh so i just found that that heinous that that uh that it seemed that the dominant reaction i got from my audience was i'm going to go out there and do what i like and if what i does kills people um i don't care it's all fake anyway so i i found that that kind of populist reaction disgusting for me, what do you think it is more? So there, there are two possibilities here that I see. The first is that um, they actually like don't care about killing people through like, you know, so they're basically, let's say they're not, they're refusing to get vaccinated, refusing to wear a mask indoors. They're killing people 
or potentially endangering people um, uh, just to get mild conveniences of not going to get the vaccine not wearing a, or not, and not wearing a mask. Do you think that's it or do you think that they genuinely think it's a hoax? In which case, if you, if you look at the law, like mens rea, state of mind matters, you know, so for moral culpability, right? Um, so, and I think that's the case here too. If, if you honestly believe it's a fraud, you may be a fool, but you're not. Right. As, I, I not think morally. they thought it was so overhyped that I think much of my audience thought it was, it was fraudulent because it was so overhyped and it became politicized in, in a way it didn't get politicized nearly as much in Europe or in Australia. So it, it COVID wasn't a, a big political issue in Australia. And, and was the it, right pretty pretty similar to the left on COVID? In no, no, because the right in Australia, at like in Europe, is not anti-government. It doesn't have mm-hmm. this instinctive, you know, rejection of of government intervention. So there was a overwhelming consensus in, in Australia, whether you're on the right or the left or the centre, that uh, the government policies were, you know, probably a, a, of of restriction and social distancing were a good idea. Interesting. So, how would you go ahead? So, how would you care? So, does Australia not have this the same level of right wing? Do they have? Is there a right wing populism in Australia? Or is it much yes, but than the, it's different. In a, in America, the number one value is freedom. In mm-hmm. in uh, Australia, the, the number one value is fairness. Interesting. So that there's no like freedom fixation and freedom fetishism in in. Uh, anywhere else in the world compared to the United States. Yeah, that's Because true. they're a product of the different enlightenment. So the United States was formed by a revolution prior to the mm-hmm. enlightenment. Then you get the enlightenment, you get this idea of like universal values and a very different British empire that uh, gave birth to Australia and New Zealand. So first enlightenment versus the enlightenment versus the pre-enlightenment i think that's right that's a lot of the difference uh yeah that's one of the reasons i actually have lately been questioning how useful the west is the term the west is as a uh, broad characterization for societies that are you know developed but also supposedly share similar value i mean i think like france for example the values are vastly different than the united states vastly different yeah, I mean, everything's relative. Like, compare the United States, France, and Japan, then France and mm-hmm. probably France and the United States may seem more similar. I'd, I'd have to have to think about. But, of course, the West is a politically correct term for Christendom. Like, the West sure, yeah. is a term to, to make the Jews feel more included. Like, the West is Christendom. Mm, but I don't know if Christianity... I'm not saying uh, Christendom's no role, not because, Christianity, but uh, Christendom. I understand what you're saying. It's different from Christianity, but maybe it's more about rich. Because I don't think people mean Russia when they say the West. I don't think it's just white. I don't think that's right. But maybe it's rich whites. I mean, wealthy white countries that are perceived as having high standards of of, of human rights and, and and education and so on. Um, I don't know though. I I think the term is is um epistemically quite problematic because the cultures are so different. France is so different than the United States. And Germany is very different than Austria, you know, even though they were the same people just a couple of generations ago, they consider themselves the same ethnicity. Um, so I, yeah, I think it is, I think the term the West does obscure more than it sheds light. Yeah, like all um, these things are compromises with like reality. French, French people are very nationalistic as you're seeing kind of with the Le Pen movement. Some of it, it does surprise me because um, France actually has a, they have a very emphatic colorblind ideology, such as it's politically incorrect in France to ask for, like, wh- where are you from? What's your ethnicity? Because the idea is we're all French. It's kind of combined with the with the xenophobia, though, and a cultural chauvinism. Uh, like, it, the, the kind of... Uh, the kind of rejection of racialism, you even see that in the Vichy regime, obviously the most racist regime um, uh, since the French Revolution, um, really in the history of France. Um, even they had a, there was a, a Laval had a, an African, a, 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 a Frenchman of, of African descent in his uh, cabinet <laughs> in Vichy, France. So uh, they have just a different ideology. It combines with like xenophobia, nationalism, a sense of superiority, if you will. And um, Le Pen is actually, um, 
she's moderated her views quite a bit, at least outwardly, and is trying to, she's presenting herself as basically a Gaullist, you know, like in the tradition of de Gaulle. Like, so kind of French chauvinism, but not, no, 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 like affinity to fascism or racialism. And, and like, you know, skeptical of immigration, but on cultural assimilation. You know, she's, she's basically tried to, she's trying to conform her right wing views to uh, French norms on race and ethnicity, which is to say, as I said, they're, homo, they're, they're culturally very homogeneous, they're nationalistic, they're proud to be French in a way that, they, that certainly they wouldn't, like Germans aren't proud to be German in that sense. Um, but they also uh, reject, you know, normative French culture rejects like racial ideology, like this person is defined as X, Y, Z and cannot be French because he's X, Y, Z. I don't think she'll win because I think her past will come out to buy her, but she has, it is interesting that she's moderating her views and has met some success with that. She certainly has more of a chance than she did last time. Mm -hmm. right. Anything you found interesting about the French election results? Well, I mean, Zamor didn't do well. The uh, he's like right. a bur, and he's kind of he kind of is pushing a more explicitly ethnically based uh, view, which is ironic because he's Jewish and um, and Berber. But nevertheless, I think he actually allowed Le Pen, I think, to present herself as more moderate because she's a, a shrewd like open uh, racial appeals whereas he's talking about things like the great replacement essentially um zamor and she isn't talking like this she's talking about assimilation cultural homogeneity but all of those things are really they may seem right-wing to americans but all those things the idea of monoculture is very normative french identity like macron wouldn't isn't saying radically different things you know i mean they are much less tolerant of, of religious freedom, for example, than we are, right? They believe in secularism in the public yeah. square. You know, they believe mu Muslim, you know, like take a high school, Muslim Muslim girls should go swimming with the boys. In French school, we go swimming, right? You know, the, the, they're, they're not going to, um, so it isn't, Macron would be considered illiberal from our point of view in many ways. Also, most Frenchmen are very hostile to woke Macron, who's, you know, center left, essentially, he and his government have condemned. Well, I don't know if you've seen that. There's been like public condemnations of this stuff from the French government, the center left French government, which reflects how different their, you know, their culture is from ours, right? Because, yeah, yeah you can become French. France has all kinds of different ethnicities, right? But, you know, you have to become French, though, right? You can't have dual identities. That's a normative view. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. Um, but that's the normative view in France, you know? Yeah, I mean, they're similar to America in that they, they believe that uh, people can assimilate and and that they believe in the, the power of ideas. Like, you yes. Know, you, which However, the big... Seems sorry, naive. Go ahead. sorry, go ahead. I'm interrupting way too much. So you're right. Um, but, but, but I would say one quick, one big qualification, though, is they're much more, they're much less tolerant of multiculturalism, even though they are, you can become French in the way you can become American, true, but they're much less tolerant of multiculturalists and they want you to be culturally French. Right. Which is like, they believe in the, the power of ideas to transform people just like uh, Americans do that. You know, you become an American or you become French by taking on our ideals. Right. And, and Le Pen is presenting herself though, as just believing that uh, more emphatically than Macron. She's, distance she like has condemned her father for example her father was a <laughs> kind of nostalgic for vichy um he found her party um i don't know if you know about yes uh, yeah you do so i think he expressed either so like kind of soft holocaust denial or dog whistle at least to it and uh, but she's condemned him and she's condemned racism you know in, in some sense um but I, I just don't know if she can overcome the baggage from her past, you know? Yep. Okay, I'm going to run off. Any any final words, Matthew? No, thank you for having me on, Luke, and I'll try to interrupt less next time. No I've, been, I've been a bit of a jerk today. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>